Hey, it's the Bennington Show, and uh, that's a little taste of what we're going to be doing, GPS Florida, on Saturday. I'm Ron Bennington. There's Gail Bennington. Yo. And I'm Ron Bennington. Hmm. It's funny, uh, it's almost like a cliche to say that Skinner's great, but when you go back, if you haven't listened for a while, man, those guys were just amazing. Yeah, they're fantastic. And that was, like, such a fun GPS, so I'm so excited. That's 3 p.m. East Saturday on Deep Tracks Channel 27. Hey, for a super tweet, um, we got a pretty cool prize lined up, too. It's uh, signed, Almond Brothers, by Greg Allman. Eat a peach, signed by Greg Allman. What's the so coolest? Tweet us. Truly one of the great albums of all time. Uh, make sure you win that for yourself. Uh, all right, Bennington Show. We got a lot of people stopping in a little later on. Joe List and Robert Kelly are going to be here. Uh, also, we're supposed to be talking to Robert Klein, right? Yes, we are. Brand new uh, documentary that he has out. But I saw some batshit stuff up on the iBank today, and that's the family who lost their shit in a hotel because... Uh, some members of the family were stuck in an elevator and they just went buck wild. <laughs> Fans, no, when you come to the Royalton, uh, one more off. One more off. One the one elevator more gets stuck. I'm recording this and I'm posting this. One more. You put the fire alarm? Pull it. Yeah, we have to pull the fire alarm. Pull it. Why would you pull a fire alarm because pull somebody's it. in an elevator? I don't know if that's going to help. No. Go break it. There's no cameras, right? <laughs> You're How do you break it? <laughs> you have yes. the camera. <laughs> Come on. Come on, guys. Next one up. Next one up. No, no, we're not worrying. It's not your fucking kids. We've been having problems with you fucking people. Fuck off. Come on. Yeah, where's this the hotel? Do you know? I don't know where there. this is, but fucking... she's just standing there, <laughs> and he's just standing there. Come on, bust it open. <laughs> Come on, Mikey was doing just a so, boy. It's being recorded too. See, he's just standing there watching us. <laughs> this is a he works for the royalty. Just to let you know, this is how we have to do it because we... this is. He's just standing there. <laughs> she keeps oh. pointing at the guy, flipping the camera around. This family is bad shit. They're crazy. They never leave a man behind. No, they stick together. I give them that, man. They're ready to have heart attacks. <laughs> well, two flights of stairs. <laughs> Yeah, Holy shit. Well, so where are they? <laughs> they are prying that elevator open with their hands. And this guy just brings over a fire extinguisher like it's going to help. <laughs> I think it will. It might. <laughs> Listen to him screaming in the... So that was one of the dudes in the elevator? Yeah, yeah, this whole family is ready to fight at all times. They are throwing down as a family. Yeah. I know families like that. Like, the whole family would beat you up if they had the opportunity. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> not a joke. <laughs> no, they're not fucking playing. <laughs> and they're mad at the Royalton or whatever that place is. No, I love that, like, <laughs> one of the kids who's, like, a teenager comes flying out of there, like... He has the same mentality of the people on the other side of the yeah. door. Like he was like waiting to come out of that elevator swinging. I don't know what the hell, why they're going to beat up a, a a bellman over the elevator network. I don't know. He does not. Con he's not an elevator operator. No. 
He probably knows as much about elevators as you or I. Well, he knows how to pry open, open the door, doesn't he? <laughs> He's just standing there. I love that she just kept flipping the camera. And the guy is just looking like, I can't do anything. Like We have to wait. He's basically saying, I'm afraid of your whole family. I like the idea that she said also, pull every fire alarm. All of them. Yeah. Yeah, I think just the one is like, that's the whole point, right? Mm-mm. No, if, if you pull more of them, more firemen come faster. <laughs> I, I didn't realize. Here's my favorite thing, though, today. Little cowboy um, shows off his rodeo skills. This kid is fucking hilarious. What is he actually even on? I, he is on, like, a barrel of some sort yeah. that he has attached a cowbell to. Yeah. And then he is creating his own rodeo. <laughs> this kid is so dead ass. He looks... Like he's in a rodeo, though. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it's a it's a perfect impression. Like, I'm not yeah. sure how he gets the movements down. <laughs> <laughs> this kid's amazing. Look at the way he even kicked his, his hat off. Now look, now he spins out. He now watch off. this. One and he one legs it up. <laughs> that kid is amazing. He kind of reminds me of Tex, a young Tex. Mm. That was like an old gas can. <laughs> hey, uh, Brian, Brian in Detroit. You know, two things. I don't know if that's security on that that floor or not, but. What kind of what kind of shithole place that has security every floor? And I love the fact the family expected him to double as security and <laughs> elevator repairman. Do everything. <laughs> they. I mean, nobody was in danger in that elevator. No, it was just stuck. I mean, I get that it's a pain in the ass. And it wasn't just like a. It was a small child in there, and like the teenager. It wasn't right. just a small child. There right. was a semi-adult there to fucking keep the little kid But that cool. kid was out of his mind. <laughs> he was fucking right. He was going insane. Now, I have been in a stuck in an elevator twice in my life. And it is crazy. Like, you would think that there would be better systems in no, place of getting people out. I get it. But the sheer panic is going to help nothing. No. And the I'm going to fucking knock you out brings nothing to it. <laughs> Like, you have kids on stuck in the elevator. You think maybe, like, a calm adult voice mm-hmm. on the other side going, we're doing everything we can. No, there was, People like, on their way. four generations of madness there. <laughs> you know? I mean, they were just a buck wild family. Because you can imagine being the littlest kid in that elevator and just hearing grown-ups, like, screaming, get them out! Get that Like, in full panic. That's why the kid, yeah. there's a little kid just screaming. Screaming crying. because he thinks he's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and what did the guy think a fire extinguisher was going to do? Look, he's just doing the best he could. He got, <laughs> yeah, he got him out. He got him out and into a fight as quickly he? as he could. The fire extinguisher is doing something, unlike that bellman who was doing nothing. Stand Look away. at him. You're being recorded. <laughs> Are there any cameras around? <laughs> uh, you know how we went through the Chris Stanley, uh, Mike Fenoya? stuff right yes which by the way ran into the gang last night again and they're still locked in but we don't know how real this is with chris well it's fucking i told them i told all of them it's real they don't believe you now uh i heard from the pit bull i have to get a thing from what flathead that said you're not returning stuff to the pit bull bobby slayton oh no not the why don't you write back to people i do usually I don't, I don't know what Bobby's talking about. Yes, you do. Do you know? Let me look up his email address. Why haven't you gotten back to him? Okay, yeah, I did. That was three days ago. I didn't, I, I'll get back to him immediately. Oh, Chris. Now, are you Bobby. making Jen part of this? Um, uh, when, I, when I get back to him, I'll CC, I'll CC Jen. But, but, he, but he when you get directly. stuff in, you should set, let Jen know. That you're not doing your work. Yeah, don't just CC. Also hit that forward button. Forward it to Jen. She'll keep a a list of everybody who's reaching out to you. There's a lot of people out there, Chris. You're just one man. 
one man who doesn't get back to people. Jesus Christ. Well, that, by the way, that shirt is filthy. Today. It's been what I've worn the shirt that? for three days straight, dude. Why? <laughs> is that spittle on yes. this? Like, it's just it's there when I wake up. And I have to go into the closet. I'm like, eh, it's still somewhat clean. Oh, I'm it's not. No, that it's zero percent clean. My ass out of this apartment. You know what, uh, Vito? Come over and get a oh picture. Oh my god! Get, come over and get a picture of this shirt because to say it's someone to this thing is dingy. That's disgusting. I, I didn't look in the mirror this morning. I'll be honest, everyone. What is all over you? I don't. I don't know. Oh, Chris. He's. <laughs> That is so gross. He's getting to the point. Let me say. This is crazy. Oh, Chris. Oh, that looks that's bad look, isn't it? Yeah, you're at work, Chris. Maybe I should turn it inside out. You think that'll be better? <laughs> Eric Econ Johnson has no idea the song that we open the show with today. Really? Now to Curtis Slow, he doesn't know. Some people don't know their uh, rock history. Well, you just got an education this morning. <laughs> well, he's saying he likes yeah, it. Okay, like, good. All right. He's not being negative. Like beat him down for it. <laughs> <laughs> he's open to it, Chris. I mean, look at you. I got How could you tonight? judge? I got I to gotta change shirts. Please change Please shirts. Wear that <laughs> Please. Oh, my God. Also, um, I'm on the uh, I'm on the, the first episode of a new Tinder podcast called Meat Market, hosted by Chris Schmidt. So uh, you should go search Meat Market on iTunes. M -E -E so that's what you're known as now, the Meat Market guy. <laughs> I, that's they, disgusting. They just oh. they heard me talking about my Tinder exploits. They wanted me on the show. Did they, were they happy with your exploits? They seem to be happy with it. They seem to be impressed by it. Ugh. Liz what? sets fire wants to know if we're going to play DS side through our Florida GPS. No, this is just a straight Southern Rock. Yeah, I did have DS side on my show in Florida though. <laughs> also, were. no less than Jake. It's just Southern yes, Rock. Yes, just Southern Rock. <laughs> There's plenty of stuff that uh, fell through the cracks there. It's seventies and eighties Southern Rock. Uh, we were kicking around what we're going to do next. We keep wanting to do Boston. Yeah. But then we got an idea for Ireland, too. That one's going to be fun. Should be. Um, forget what else is going on. All right. There's another thing up on the iBank today. It was this. I've never seen a turtle this fast in my life. Is this, is, I mean, is, am I looking at something that isn't even real? <laughs> Let me see this turtle. <laughs> Floating. Jesus Christ, Chris. You know, we love it. takes so events. long. It's the internet here. I don't believe you. It definitely is. Everyone's complained about it. <laughs> nope, just us. <laughs> <laughs> IT doesn't even want to hear about it anymore. They just say we know and hang up on me. It's wonderful. I know, it's what you got to do for your work. They don't care. Do you walk in there with shirts looking like that? Because they might not take you seriously. It's phone calls. Maybe okay? if you went in a nice, crisp white shirt, <laughs> they might take you a little. I'm not a Mormon, Rock. <laughs> Why not? I Short sleeve be. white shirt. I think that could be a good look for you. They say every girl crazy about a sharp dressed man. Shit. Where are you taking your date tonight? A Tinder date. Uh, I think we're going to a bar downtown. I haven't really decided what bar yet. I just vaguely just said, hey, we're going downtown. <laughs> You will you will go home though first, right? I yeah, I think Could I, I recommend the stand? Maybe we'll go to the stand tonight. You bring her in there, press up her against her at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Is this what you like, miss? There's a lot of uh Tinder dates there. Really? Yeah, I think a lot of people feel comfortable. Crowd. Yeah, I don't know though, like I mean, comedy is an intense first date. Yeah, I mean, it's just like even a movie or something. Just the two of you sitting next to each other looking at something else. <laughs> Seems weird to me. I think I think a movie is the worst first date. I would never do a movie as a first date because that's no different. You're only five minutes difference from that feeling when the movie is so crowded you have to sit next to a stranger. I think the perfect first date is heroin. 
<laughs> want to boot up? I'm telling you, I I've had this. And I know you guys haven't noticed, but I'm I'm dealing with this cold. I know. Yesterday, I got the shivers like I was dope sick, like I was kicking fucking junk. I think that's the worst part. I've never like, had that before outside of you know trying to get rid of uh, some kind of chemical in my body, and I'm like. Am, am I dying? You probably had a fever, and your fever was bad, and that gives you those chills. It's like a body cold. It infects the whole body. I didn't even know that. Yeah. You need to rest. You give too much. I think I do. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, this is that turtle? Yeah. Finally? All right, go ahead. Look how fast that turtle is. Whoa. Wait, that turtle is playing ball. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that turtle is fetching. This guy would die. This fucking, seriously, this turtle is adorable. <laughs> <laughs> this guy'd be so much better than all the other turtles out in nature. <laughs> He'd be the fastest turtle. Just, we're not, lo- don't pay attention to him. <laughs> I'm just. You know, my favorite thing is when Chris says something like that, I always check. Yeah. I always check. To Beto, see. are you embarrassed for him? <laughs> yeah, well, one, I What's like that? that he made it a qualifying statement that he's only better than the turtles in nature. No household turtles. <laughs> I'm just it's saying. like, uh, this guy's so much better than the turtles in nature, am I right? You throw this Chris, fucking, yeah. you don't want to be known as the stupid guy. I'm not stupid. I'm, I'm making a, I'm making no, a smart no, comment. No, no, It isn't. All right, you see this it turtle, isn't. how fast it is, right? <laughs> And then there's all these turtles out there that are slow in nature. You put this guy out in nature, he's going to fucking be faster than all the other turtles. Obviously, he's still in nature. He's not some fucking trained super <laughs> turtle. He's a natural turtle like the others. You're letting yourself sound dumb. And you got to stop it. Fun fact, Ron, this is actually the fastest turtle. <laughs> no demand. The, except the ninja turtles. They're probably fast. I know. All right, say no, they're not. You, know, <laughs> you scumbag. You Everybody's got real? you listed as a dope, and you don't want to do that, Chris. Because you're a regular fucking person. I'm you're just, like a real you're like a real man, okay? I'm, and you don't want yourself <laughs> talking like a nut. <laughs> I'm gonna fucking take you to Bellevue. I feel like I'm only going if I'm forced. You know, I'm never gonna go voluntarily. Yeah, no one ever goes voluntarily. Alright, good. You know, they're gonna throw a fucking net over you and drag you off <laughs> while you're talking about nature. I'm gonna fight back too, man. They're not they're gonna have to fucking put So me down. what? Bite. That's what you do. <laughs> I bite. You're in a bite fight. <laughs> For no you better watch watch it. <laughs> I'm gonna nip at him. <laughs> right, stop, Chris. Stop talking insane. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna get it together. I'm starting to think this show needs a vacation. <laughs> Getting too loopy? Yeah, way, way loopy. <laughs> Um, I now a guy claims that he had to take over for his Lyft driver because his Lyft driver was drunk. But I watched this, and if I was on the jury, I would say I'm witnessing a carjacking. I don't think that the driver was even drunk. I thought he was just too emasculated to hold his position and he let somebody take over his car yeah i think that if somebody was drunk wouldn't be wouldn't your first reaction be to get out of said car instead of just like i'll handle this and be threatening the guy the whole time i mean it's really a fucking strange thing uh anyway up on the eye bank all right, God, turn it up, Chris. Robert King draft, sir. Sir, take, you man, we ain't hear none of that. You cancel it. Hey, Slopes, oh. dry this motherfucker, Charlie. We done made the lift nigga get out the seat. <laughs> we driving, nigga, sir. Nah, Thank sir, you. nothing. Sir, Be quiet. Off, Hush turn, up. Turn it off. Hush up. Turn it so off. Cancel. Turn it off. Cancel it now. Cancel it now before I put it on you. Cancel it now before I put it on you. Cancel it. Take his phone and do Cancel it. it while I put it on you in here, China man. Oh no. Cancel it. We done already that we done already then took over your vehicle. Cancel it while I get on you. And them glasses be mine. You hear me? This is a carjacking. <laughs> this is, this is, this somebody is a kidnapping. Kid. Jesus Christ. He's threatening the guy. And he puts it up as the guy was drunk and we had to take over. I think he just has an accent. But he's calling him China man. 
He's threatening to take his glasses. Oh, he's not paying because he says that they've taken over the driving. <laughs> well, we're going to put it on him. Holy shit. I mean, I want to say a follow up on this. I mean, Lyft's got to get behind. Got to get behind this guy. What the fuck are they doing? Well, forget Lyft. This has got to be the uh, the police. The law needs to be involved. You need Johnny Law to step in here <laughs> and take a look at this. Like what? Like, all right. If somebody was drunk, you wouldn't just say, "And I'm going to steal your sunglasses if you keep talking." That doesn't even make sense. No. That now, makes zero sense. No, Chris. Uh, Adam Pally got. Picked up about a block from here, right? Yeah, one, uh, two blocks over. No, he was smoking uh, a vape. Yeah, and they said he had a little bit of coke on him. Yeah, when they they, they like they were giving him a ticket for uh, the vaporizer, and then they found when they when they like searched them, they found a little bag of coke. No, how's he not go to jail for that? How's that just uh, written up when it's coke? The, yeah, the weed thing makes sense, but yeah, they just put a game like a bench warrant. Like this is your this is your court date. Come now. It's fucking coke. Like that's it. it you would think. Really weird. Or maybe they're Adam Pally fans. And they're like, well, who isn't? We'll arrest you, Adam Pally, but we're not going to put you yeah, in jail. Yeah, but then you wouldn't report that that person had cocaine on them. Right. Like, if you were going to do a weed. shady thing, you would just say, yeah, we'll forget but, that we saw this. Like, see, the thing is that when you have a little bit of coke, right? It means you used to have a lot of coke. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it means you're coked up right now. <laughs> <laughs> no one. Just says, hey, can I get a little bit of Coke from you? Just a little. Now, I I mean, I got no problem. With, I don't think the guy was bothering anybody. He's walking down the street. He has a little bit of fucking Coke. He's fucking vaping. He should have been left alone. But I just thought it was weird that they wrote up a ticket for Coke. Yeah. Instead of fucking taking somebody in. Yeah, it's it's not. I think, I guess Coke's decriminalized in New York City. No, it You're isn't. You're saying I guess that. It you know it's not true. <laughs> Pally's getting away with it. That doesn't make it decriminalized. That's what we're saying. This is a weird thing that we just heard rather than the norm. And isn't it like in New York, isn't it like the Rockefeller drug laws? Like there's some like really strict uh, like. Yeah, I never. I don't even know if they're still around those Rockefeller drug laws. I think they might have. Uh, they got rid of them? them. Or they're not as strict as they used to be. Yeah. Because I know at it one time. It used to be three was, and out. Yeah. It was that. And then like the quantity was preposterous like the very smallest amount of weed and they'd be like oh you're a dealer yeah, you're a felon right yeah well the weed they've they've taken down but the, another thing that got brought up about that is that they were harder on crack than they were on coke so basically they were harder on black right. drugs than they were on white people drugs because wall street guys love coke but they never fucking smoke crack maybe they should try it maybe they'll help pussies. with the hedge fund <laughs> some people are pussies what can i tell you Spark that rock. So anyway, we can't get to the bottom of this, of why this, you can just get written up a ticket for fucking having coke. Yeah, I've never heard of that before. You're and, just like on the par of just like, sir. And you know his uh, his TV network must be fucking freaking out right now. Yeah. Because, you know, people still throw co coke up there as a, as a scary thing. Yeah, I would say, you know... People put that in the heavy drug arena. Mm, sad. <laughs> sad we live in that kind of world. It's awful. So it looks like if it's your first offense, it goes down as a misdemeanor, even if that is cocaine you got on you. And it, does amazing. that go for any drug? Uh, I, got, I think so. It says whether you're, a, uh, uh, whether you're arrested for possessing cocaine, heroin, or crack, your first possession is a misdemeanor. It's amazing. Really? Is it? Is it? Do they care about weight? Seems I mean, worth can the I risk. Have fucking, <laughs> a couple yeah. keys. <laughs> yeah, can I have a key of coke? And I'm just walking down the fucking street. Is that a, a misdemeanor? So this is my first key of coke. <laughs> it says the misdemeanor still. You can still get a year in jail for the misdemeanor, though. Oh, he ain't gonna get any time in jail. Hell no. He didn't do anything. <laughs> Let's fucking face it. He's just enjoying some vape. That's all. And a little fucking blow while he walked through in the city. I'm more shocked about getting stopped for the vape because I see people vaping everywhere in Doesn't buildings. Mean that you can do it. Yeah, it's still, it's I thought we were cool with it now. Huh? I just thought we were cool with it now, and you could do it wherever you wanted. Yeah, no, you can't. I mean, it's like a lot of times you see people walking around with a fucking glass of wine. It still doesn't make it okay. You can't be like saying a cup. I saw other people drinking wine. Okay. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. 
Uh, are th- these guys here? Yes, they are. Uh, Robert Klein and Marshall Fine have a uh, a brand new doc um, appearing on Stars. It's Robert Klein still can't stop his leg. Is the name of it? Uh, are they on their way in? Yes, they are. All right, so let's bring in uh, Robert Klein and Marshall Fine. <laughs> Robert Klein and Marshall Fine are in studio with us. Robert Klein still can't stop his leg. Is premiering tomorrow night at 10 p.m. on Stars. Go to stars. dot com for more information. Uh, nice to see you guys. Congratulations on the documentary. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, which uh, whose idea was the documentary? It was mine. Yes. It was. Uh, I've been a writer for, you know, for my whole life, and I was uh, have written a couple books and decided I wanted to make a documentary instead because I know how to write a book. Mm-hmm. And I've known Robert for about 20 years and thought that he was a pioneer who deserved the kind of attention that he wasn't getting, that there was a generation that sort of didn't know who he was, that did know George Carlin or Richard Pryor. Uh, and of the three, the three of them changed comedy at the end of the 60s. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if you ask the co- ask. The comedians that I interview in this movie, people like Bill Maher and John Stewart, Jay Leno, Jerry Seinfeld, who is most influential on them? They all say Robert Klein. Now, uh, Robert, is that something that's that seems strange for you to hear uh, from people saying that? Oh, this guy changed my life. I mean, Seinfeld in the movie says he wouldn't be doing what he was doing. He says you changed my life. He, yeah. said, he yeah. said that literally. Um, I it, well. I've seen myself on the big screen and the little screen for years, and I've heard this publicly. I mean, on the very last uh, Jay Leno Tonight Show, there's a little segment in the in the uh, documentary about it. And Billy Crystal was his last guest there. He says, you know, uh, well, you had a ratty apartment in Boston, Jay. We all used to crash there. You had no furniture. You had one thing on the wall, a Robert Klein Child of the 50s poster, you know. The... The mind blower was seeing them say it in heartfelt. Mm-hmm. You know, we all get asked, to, I, I get asked to be interviewed for a lot of books about comedy and I just, that CNN history of comedy and all that sort of stuff. But these guys, nobody had to twist their arm. Marshall got them. It moved me a lot to see when Leno says, you know, when you're a kid in rural Massachusetts and you want to go into comedy, People come up to your mother and say, uh, is Jay over that comedy thing yet? You know, and you could point to Robert Klein. He was like a normal guy and uh, not the guy in the tuxedo with the cufflinks and my girlfriend. But blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and so it, it's I, I'd be lying if I, I said it wasn't flattering at the same time. Uh, I, being a kind of eminence grease like the uh, the old uh, the old professor. Mm-hmm. Um uh, I'm like Huckleberry Finn and, and Tom Sawyer. They all talk in the past tense. Not because they know they think I'm not working anymore. They know I am. But they're talking about when I impress them and all that. So, uh, you know, uh, oh, he was potent. Mm-hmm. Jerry. He was the Beatles of comedy to me, Jerry Seinfeld says. So I could hear my own eulogy and walk out of there alive. <laughs> yeah. you, can't <laughs> you can't be. But you do. I mean, you you get on stage. How many how many times uh, a month are you up on stage? Now, in fact, uh, la- last month or so, I was busy. I'm working this weekend, Saturday mm-hmm. and Sunday. I have shows. One in Rhode Island. Um, I don't know. Maybe forty a year now. Yeah. Um, um, a television show I was a regular on got canceled last uh, year. Uh, uh, Mysteries of Laura with mm. Deborah Messing. I played her father. I play fathers now. <laughs> yes. I, I used to kiss the uh, leading ladies. Now I'm their father. I'm not crazy about that because up here I'm not old yet. My body is old. So when so I played Sandra Bullock's father in a movie, she'd walk in in the morning. She's a great woman. I love her. She would to come to work she, in the morning, and I just kind of suck it in a little. You know, <laughs> what am I think? She's some demented gerontophile who likes old people with forty years older than she. So it's a strange thing. But I'm an old actor. I've been doing it for Fe- Fred Willard and I were hired at sixty uh, at Second City fifty two years ago. It's amazing, right? It is amazing. 52 years great ago. Great for Yeah, and uh, that was to be able to do Second City in that era uh, was pretty amazing. 
Great, yeah. great people came out. Yeah, David Steinberg says we were like rock stars in Chicago then. Yeah. And we were. And we were the hottest thing. Second City was still new, about four or five years old. Now it's an empire. It is fed Saturday Night Live for 40 years. Uh, so many comedy movies. I'm doing Colbert tonight. He's a Second City guy. I yeah. mean, it's just endless. It was a, it's a wonderful, wonderful place to start. But then you made that thing that... that transformation into just doing stand-up you know without just acting and who were your contemporaries who were the people that you were working with at that time in second city no but as a stand-up who were the other stand-ups that you would say kind of were in, in your class well they were two or three years ahead of me but prior and george uh, carlin you know yeah. um, george and i were both nominated for Grammy Awards for our albums in 73 and 74. Of course, he won. And AMFM was a wonderful album. I did Child of the 50s. Um, I, I think we're grouped together a lot. They had uh, actually much larger careers. I guess I wasn't quite for everybody, but I have no regrets. I did what I did. They did what they did. They were friends, colleagues, and uh, mighty good comedians. I keep Close contact. I keep contact with Kelly Carlin, uh, Great. George's daughter, uh, Rain Pryor. I, uh, Rodney Dangerfield's daughter, uh, is, Melanie, is in the movie, too. Uh, Rodney was a tremendous, um, not inspiration as much as an instructor. Believe it or not, our styles are so different. But I learned more about stand-up comedy. There was no stand-up comedy teacher at the Yale Drama School when I mm -hmm. went there. Yeah, so, you know, Rodney was my Yale drama school for, for comedy and uh, his technique and all the stuff he knew, it was, it was invaluable to me. Wasn't David Brenner one of your contemporaries? David Brenner was a contemporary. That's mm. true. That's true. David Fry? David Fry. You're talking about all dead people. That's, that's, <laughs> a, see, that's the way I get a lot of work. Yeah. I happen to be alive. And if, you, if you can't show up for work. <laughs> David Fry, may, I don't know, many of your listeners may not remember him. He was, um, he, he was an incredible impressionist. He was a tiny little guy, five foot four, with a Napoleonic complex, and he drank too much. But he became LBJ. His face changed everything. And Nixon. And Nixon, tremendous. And he had no personality of his own. When he talked as David Fry, it was doing some imitation of what he thought David Fry should sound like. And I remember when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, and uh, he was kind of drunkish in the back row of the improv, and the place was, you know, emptying out at night. He said, I'll be honest with you. I'm sorry he got killed. But it was one of my best voices. You know, that is, right. that is, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it. But, but I met him at a urinal at the Cafe Wa. I'm serious. I, I, when I was a kid starting out, I went down to Hootenanny night. And I go down and it, 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 for some play, reason, this, this, this little tiny club had three big 19th century urinals, like uh, ornate yeah. things there. And and there's a guy and there's a mirror above it and he's going yeah you yeah ha, and I went he was at urinal one I went to four <laughs> to be as far away as possible not what it you want to hear in the mix <laughs> yes. it, it was him practicing his voices um, a little sidelight but Rodney he was heckling Rodney one night at the improv and and Rodney said. Don't you raise your voices to me. You know, <laughs> Rodney yeah. was quick. Man. Yeah, he was fast. I mean, he, when he went yeah. on Tonight Show, it was all prepared jokes. Yeah. But he could improvise, man. He was quick. But there was a, a purity to Rodney's jokes, too, right? I mean, there was just, there, there was just pure jokes. Well, early on, he wrote his own stuff. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, uh, Russell Baker, who used to write for the Times, Odd Buckwald, they were humorists, you know. Rodney wrote jokes worthy of that kind of exposure. For example, I'll tell you, our parks are unsafe, our streets are unsafe, our schools are unsafe, but under our arms we have complete protection. You know? <laughs> uh, or, uh, you know, I, I, I played some tough clubs, you know. I mean, uh, you know, Vito's, formerly Aldo's, formerly La Pazzo's, formerly Nunzio. I tell you, this Nunzio's was a tough club, you know. 
He went into Nunzio's. He went down two steps, physically and socially. You know? <laughs> they are beautiful. Yeah. They're beautifully crafted. And while he lacked certain discipline in his personal life, you know, uh, um, um, he ate too much or he, he never stopped smoking cigarettes, I think, till near the very end. And alcohol and drugs, whatever it was. When he had a Tonight Show, two months, three months before he starts preparing, he would write the jokes on a shirt cardboard. And, and and try them. Tell me, is this funny? You know, he tried on him, friends. <laughs> he was, and that's one of the key things I got from him, to be prepared. When you go on one of these talk shows, there are millions of people watching, you know? Yeah. So you just make sure you kill them every time and then you do your best to do that. It was that kind of thing, like having a coach. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. We had a wonderful relationship. Well, you know, you brought up about the uh, going on The Tonight Show. Johnny... And you had a special relationship. Well, you know what? He was the best at it. We we did not have much of a personal relationship. We did spend a little time away from the show a few times. But when sometimes only he and the band were laughing. When I was delivering, maybe it was a little too hip for the room until I you know, figured out how to do it. If you prepared and you went on his show, he laughed you up. He was incredibly generous. And he was as good the day he left... Yeah. As the day he came, even though he was old, because, um, you, you know, they were paying him they, for one tenth of what they were paying him. They could get as large an audience, if not larger, with Leno. It had begun to dissipate a little. Mm -hmm. You know, he wanted big band. He wanted uh, Severance and uh, Doc Severance and I worked together once. And he said, I wanted to do some jazz fusion. I wanted to hip it up a little bit. Johnny said, big band. That's what he wanted. You know, he stuck to his thing. But he was the best at it. He knew how to work with comedians. He knew when your punchline was coming. Merv Griffin was a great guy, but he'd step right on your punchline. Letterman was good, too. Letterman knew how to lay back. I know him when he came to New York from, as a weatherman. He came into our office, management office, Rollins and Jaffe. My managers, the, the office, discovered in one year, Letterman, Billy Crystal, and Robin Williams. How's that for a catch? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Um, uh, it's, uh, stars, uh, Robert Klein can't stop his leg premiering tomorrow. Still tomor can't stop his leg. Still can't stop his leg premiering tomorrow night, uh, 10 p.m. on Stars and Marshall. You, uh, you mainly just kind of fly on the wall with some of this. I mean, you guys didn't plan what you were doing, uh, with the documentary. Uh, some of it we did. I mean, there's only so much you can plan. I mean, basically mm -hmm. what we said is... Let's go to the supermarket and see right. what, and see what happens, <laughs> right. and then you turn him loose. Or you know, we went to uh, downtown Briarcliff Manor uh, near where Robert lives. Uh, he wanted to go to the hardware store. I thought there would be something funny there. We ran into a crowd of little girls who were just getting out of school. It's amazing. Were attracted by the camera, and it turned into you know. It was I the, love that moment. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was that, that was like the centerpiece of the sizzle reel we put together to sell the movie, and it's still one of the most charming things in the film. And remember the, the little girls go Google, Google, you Google, Google, right, Google yeah, on their right. phones. These kids yeah. are so so. They hip. didn't know. They don't know me as a stand-up comedian. Yeah, and, you know, they know me from some movies, but they go Google, Google. Yeah. <laughs> So that's what that is a really funny thing though too, right? That those kids could end up finding out with your whole career within seconds. Within seconds, and yeah. I live in an era, you know, I'm 75. I was born in 1942. We got a TV in 1951. It was the most exciting thing that ever happened. I, I can feel the excitement now. I was nine, and my father and my uncle trying to put up an antenna in the Bronx on the. No, move it a little more. That's it. To the no, turn it. I still have snow. You know, I mean, there was no cable. There was no, and then. Uh, in 75, my agent gets a call from a guy named Harlan Kleiman, who just passed away. He was he was pr uh, uh, programming HBO, which was brand new. It wasn't called HBO. It was called Home Box, Box Office. Office. And they showed feature films that had just a month before been in the movies. So that's what you were getting, a real, no, no commercial interruption. There had been no original programming until, you know, I did that thing at Haverford College. And, of course, I've done nine of them. And it was the most wonderful artistic freedom I ever had. They never interfered in one word, never said, take this out or that out. I came from, 
you know, uh, hassling in the hall with Freddie the Cordoba, who produced The Tonight Show for years, uh, calling lawyers in New York. Can he say this? Can he say that? You know, not necessarily profanity, but political idea, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the whole thing has changed, uh, perhaps too much the other way, where every other word is is profanity rather than wit. I mean, profanity is important when used aptly. You know, I don't mind that it's part of the language, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of, like, every bodily function, but hey, you can say what you want. You censor with your purse and your remote. If you don't like it, you have something else, you know. But you came in with that conversational style that I don't think really existed in comedy. Before then, um, let's see. Uh, well, well, they were they were phone acts like like um, um, Bob Newhart. Yeah, used to uh, a kind of very funny monologue, the bus driver school or something. Shelley Berman had a thing where he's talking with his old dad on the phone. Mm -hmm. There were people who had broken the mold. Uh, Woody Allen was certainly different, of course. Woody and and uh, Albert Brooks and and. Uh, uh, they they never and Steve Martin they really never liked they never felt comfortable in stand up they were all good at it mm -hmm. but they wanted to do other things I wanted to stay with that and also do other things you know I've been in forty feature films or so hundreds of television shows uh, four albums nine HBOs I wrote a book I've uh, been on Broadway six shows the idea is I always worked it kept me uh, interested. I didn't have to just hang around in, in one era, and it kept me working, and I enjoyed it. I, I don't want to do Broadway anymore. You have to show up eight times a week, and that's tough, yeah. you know, but it was exciting. I get my live audience rocks off by doing stand-up, and yeah. uh, it's still tremendous fun making people laugh. And you'll go into, the, like, the Gotham Comedy Club with... Uh and just walk up and see what happens, right? Well, um, more the Metropolitan Room. Right. Um, my son, Ali, is actually having a show there tonight. He's going to miss my tomorrow premiere. Night. Tomorrow, night. Uh, tomorrow night, sorry. Um, uh, you know, with a bunch of five or six young unknown comedians. The Gotham, the Metropolitan Room is the old Gotham. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I work enough. I don't need to do that so much. But I do a, a charity every year for the Madeline Kahn Ovarian Cancer Benefit. She was one of my best friends. Uh, there's a Peter Boyle, my multiple myeloma. He was one of my best friends. I do the Red Nidus Pigmentosa at the Gotham Comedy Club every year. There's enough work. So, but he uh, has an opening for more diseases if there are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm open to, open to causes. I try to get back what little I can. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, you know, that's something you get asked to do a lot of. Um, uh, you know, I have so much material that I've written over the years. I always am improvising something or other. So, but you know, something I'd like to go to one of these for Jimmy Norton goes there. Uh, what's the name of the place, Al? That, uh, the, the comedy cellar. The, the comedy cellar. cellar. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to just see the atmosphere there because, uh, I haven't been in that scene in a long time. I remember, um, uh, meeting, uh, Dave Chappelle years ago at a place called Rebar, mm -hmm. uh, exchanged ideas, uh, a nice kid. Then he somehow disappeared and then he came back and uh, he's quite an interesting guy. What a, what a talent. Uh, well, also, I think one of the great parts of the documentary, too, is where you're just hanging with Rickles. And uh, <laughs> that's, uh, again, we're talking about pure comedy. Oh, my God. It, it never stops with him. You know what? It, it reminded me of Jonathan Winters, one of my yeah. great heroes. Uh, there's a Paul Provenza thing, Green Room, I did with Jonathan. His body was a wreck, but his mind was right there. Same with Rickles. He was kind of bent over when we shot this thing, but, you know, Marshall goes up to him at the end and said, uh, Mr. Rickles, um, my name is Marshall Fine, and I, I'm doing a documentary about Robert Klein. He says, are you that much in need of money, Marshall? <laughs> you know, without a hesitation. Yeah. Makes me laugh every time. He's not intellectual. He's not political. He is brilliant. There's a rhythmic thing there, and he can get away with it. You know, he's in front of an audience. There's a definite odor here. Is that your wife, sir? Oh, he just can do it. And when you, when civilians try to do that, they get in trouble. Sure. Howard Cosell is the perfect example. He used to be so annoying trying to be Rickles. Yeah. Yes, there has to be something so likable about the guy for him to be able to act that way. You he can't... is a nice man. Yeah. Um, and um, that kind of period of 
so many people that were working in the village in the 60s, I think, is uh, it was you, it was Steinberg was there, uh, Joan Rivers was there at the time, Bill Cosby. It had to be pretty exciting, right, when that was all popping. Well, Cosby was already pretty established. And by the way, I mean, I think, uh, don't jump to conclusions. Just a case of he said, she 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 said. Daily News stole my joke. They put it on the cover. Is that right? That's right. I was doing it for months. And then I said, um... No, he certainly was different. It wasn't the uh, set up joke punchline. Uh, uh, the best of all time at that was Rodney Dangerfield because the jokes were superior. Um, and I have no, no problem. I saw live comedy in the Bosch Belt. I saw it on television, of course, and I loved all the comedians because I was a class clown, just like my son Ali was a class clown and my father was a class clown. That's how we started, by being stupid in, in class and trying to get laughs. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's still so much fun to make people laugh when, when people laugh, I don't know if it cures cancer or anything like that. Some people claim, you know, humor, but just, it makes people feel good just to this. I did, I did a, five shows just now in, uh, in Florida, various audiences and all that. It's just, you know. It's such a wonderful feeling to get that thing coming back at you, that big laugh. And they feel so great. People love to laugh. They forget their disappointment in their life or their children or their health or whatever for that few moments. And I've gotten many touching letters over the years. My brother had brain cancer. His final, you made him laugh and so forth and so on. That makes it sound almost sacred. Yes, know? right. <laughs> yeah, like that isn't your intention, but when that happens, it's it's pretty amazing. That's true. It's pretty amazing. Who were some of the Borscht Belt comics that <clears throat> you saw when you were a kid? Well, no one would know them uh, for the most part. Um, Lou Manchel, Larry Deutsch, Bernie Burns. Um, they, they, I remember as a kid, I was a lifeguard you know, and a, 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 a bus boy in these hotels in the Catskills. And they'd come in their Cadillac, invariably had a Cadillac. And they'd arrive at this small hotel or bungalow colony, whatever. And they'd make 250 people scream with laughter for 40 minutes. And they'd get into their Cadillac and go to some other place and do it. And I said, wow, what a, <laughs> what a profession. What a way to make a living. You know, my father was selling textiles as a salesman, 2% commission, 10 blocks from here in the Garmin Center. He hated his work. My mother worked at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. My sister was a teacher. They had these conventional jobs. What a job that was. And I thought of that. My first trip to Ireland, in the, on a Tuesday afternoon, I'm riding a pony with the <laughs> mist in my nostrils, riding in the, in the hills of, of, of Ireland and thinking, man, this is great. You know, show business. <laughs> show business. Uh, it's tomorrow night. Robert Klein still can't stop his like 10 p.m. on Stars. Robert Klein, Marshall Fine. Thanks so much for Thank coming. Thank you. It'll so be much. on the, the app and it'll be on on demand for quite a while. It'll show quite a lot. Great. Know, so on Stars. All right. Thanks well, for having us, Rob. Sure. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs> Happy birthday to uh, Queen Elizabeth. Happy birthday, Your Highness. From the Benningtons. Um, what is today? Thursday? It is. So, uh, tomorrow, uh, Saturday, uh, we're going to be doing a kick-ass GPS, Southern Rock, Florida style. That's this Saturday, 3 p.m. East on Deep Tracks, Channel 27. And there's a tweet contest, and we're giving out signed Eat a Peach, signed by Greg Oman. Oh, that's just fantastic. It is fantastic. This was a really fun GPS. Yeah, it was a cool one. It was a really, really cool one. Uh, I like Southern Rock more than I even think I do. Yeah. I have no choice but to like it. It just seems like it's in my blood. Well, I think it's, uh, you know, it's really American music. And uh, somebody brought up, maybe it was you, that it sounds more like modern country now. Yeah. Modern country has a, more of a southern rock thing. And I hadn't, hadn't really con considered that. Yeah, it had a 
I think it just almost even a bigger impact on country music because, yeah, like it kind of did away with that kind of old timey kind of cowboy tune. I mean, obviously, there's still people who do it, but yeah. most popular modern day country is like Southern rock. Nashville yeah. country is very, yeah. very Southern rock. Yeah. Interesting. Now I'm wondering what would have uh, uh, Ivanka Trump. Look, there she is. She's got such a nice voice, doesn't she, Ivanka Trunk? I got, I always listen to her talk. Really, I, I'm not sure if I've like honed in on it. It's very much like this. Well, I try to do the best I can. There's so many things I care about. <laughs> well, that sounds very comforting. comforting. Yeah, it's a very comforting voice. My dad's a lunatic, <laughs> <laughs> but I trust you, Ivanka. Yeah. Donald really likes to have his his family around him. Yeah, he's a family man. He's a family guy. Which you wouldn't even think, because I can't picture him rolling around on the floor with kids. I have a feeling like he liked them once they got older. Yeah, he's like a family businessman. Yeah. He's like, you will join the family band. That's good, though. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, I was a paper boy, and this uh, family used to have a fruit stand, right? I used to think it was the greatest thing in the world. The whole family would be working at the fruit stand. Yeah. And I say to my dad, I go, why can't we do something like that? He goes, oh, God, I'd kill you guys. <laughs> he goes, I would take a, I'd take a knife and kill you all. And now you do have a family band. I guess I do. Uh, Chris is... Uh... Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> not blood-related, Chris. <laughs> He's not blood-related? Well, there's blood all over that shirt of his. Yeah. But By the like... way, you cleaned up some of those stains. What was those stains on you? I think they, it, was, it, they looked like drool and spittle all over his... I know I was um, drinking and some water fell out of my mouth earlier. Uh, Robert Klein was disgusted by you. Yeah. <sighs> he made a this. face when he when he saw your stains. I didn't want to disgust him. I wanted to have a nice experience. Uh, I didn't know that Marshall Fine uh, Vito uh, said, Vito, come in here, would you, buddy? Hey, Vito. Run. Run, Vito. Run. It's fast. Uh, while we're doing that, we want to remind everybody we are going to Austin for the Moon Tower uh, Comedy Festival, and we are doing Comedy 101 there, first time outside of New York. And you can get free passes if you're a um, uh, a big fan of uh, this scene, because it's going to be great. And we're going to be using the bonfire guys as judges, so just go fun. to the iBang. It's happening Thursday, April 20th at 9 p.m. at Antone's Nightclub. For a chance of free tickets, go to the Terrorbang.com. 420. <laughs> 420. It's yeah. happening on 420. This is a 420 Comedy 101. But, you know, well, first of all, we have that, but it's also the anniversary of the Bennington Show. Yes, that is also our... Everything we do is I mean, going around we. It's literally a tower, at, uh, a party at the Moon Tower. Like, that's what we're having. <laughs> it's an anniversary party. Now, you were saying Marshall Fine is famous as a movie critic for something that was in here with us. Yeah, so... He was the first person to give The Dark Knight a bad review. And it was a big deal with Rotten Tomatoes. Because like when you click Rotten, that comes up. And people were attacking him and going to his website. They had to remove his review and a link to his website from Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. I don't think I've ever attacked anyone online for a bad review. Dude, people get mad if, you, if like a movie's getting like a to movie. 100. And like, the one, like you saw what happened with uh, Get Out. People were freaking out about uh, Armand White. You didn't see that? I love Armand White. Oh, I didn't, I didn't well understand the faces. I don't know why everyone's Armanding him. <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, first of all, they're embarrassing, these people that won 100%, because it doesn't mean anything. If you go back and read those reviews, some of the reviews that come across as fresh seem like they're insulting. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, I won't see that as a positive review. <laughs> Who decides it's a positive? I think you, when you make the review, I, I guess you just click. I don't think so. Oh, you don't? I don't think so. I think oh, really? somebody else decides whether it's positive or negative. Interesting. Because I, look, if somebody says to me, um, would you recommend this movie, no matter what the movie was, I'd be like, yes, but recommend the movie to whom? You know what I mean? Yeah. What type of person? Like, there's plenty of movies that I would recommend to Vito that I wouldn't recommend to Gail. Yeah. You know? Child uh, movies. <laughs> same. Uh, 
So I'm, I would always think about the person I was recommending, not whether or not I would recommend a movie. That's, it's an insane thought. I actually, particularly if I'm interested in a movie, I tend to stay away from reviews. I only read reviews after having seen a movie, which I know I understand is like the opposite of what it's for. But then I no, suddenly I get so. so I get interested in yeah. what somebody would look at it in a critical way, or yeah. you know, if this is what this person does for a living, I'm interested in their opinion. But I don't take it that seriously, and I don't think I've ever not seen a movie because I heard that the reviews were bad or I heard, you know. See, I think this, what you want is to, and it's the same way for political talk. If there's a person that you trust, that's much more interesting right? than a person who, uh, than taking 100 people's opinion. So you find one critic. If there's a guy that I'm like, oh, I'm right. in his wheelhouse. He knows me. Right. You know what I mean? I get it. I would be much uh, more apt to follow that than just the 100 people and what they happen to think. Right. And whether they give it a squishy tomato or not. like that. It's nice to have a squishy tomato, <laughs> but it doesn't always work out that way. Yeah. I don't know that most... Um, I don't know. I mean, do you feel like most of your opinions on movies is like as broad as good, bad or thumbs up, thumbs down. I mean, yeah. it has to be a really bad movie to be like, it is a complete thumb down and it has to be an insanely good movie to say. Most things are in that gray area where it's like, Oh yeah, I like the characters and like, I like this about the story. The ending maybe wasn't handled the way I would have liked, or, you know, whatever. I'm down to like 95% of the movies I don't like. Yeah. I'm at that point now because movies have gotten so bad. It's very rare for me to go, well, this is a really, this is a worthwhile two hours. Yeah. Most movies stink. I watched a Doctor Strange the other night, and I just felt like an idiot for watching it. It was so fucking terrible. It's just, it's just, it's a waste of time to watch fucking most of these fucking movies. And yet, Rotten Tomatoes probably gave that a pretty high thing. I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, because they're bu these aren't like movie critics. These are a bunch of fucking weird kids who like comic book movies. That was a movie that I was so unaware that everyone was talking. I was just thinking that it was Doctor Who until <laughs> somebody British called girl. in and said, no, you're so confused. I'm like, well, who's strange then? I don't know the difference. Someone um, said to me, they go, have you seen Lego Batman? I go, first of all, how am I going to see Lego Batman? I'm a fucking adult. <laughs> it's not ever going to happen. And these are the kind of people that review movies now. That they'll write about Lego Batman. And how great it is. My review would be this. Uh, Lego Batman came out. I don't know. Take your kid to it. That would be my <laughs> review. If not, just watch the Flintstones with your kid. Because they'll be just as happy. Well, Brett Ratner is like taking a stand against Rotten Tomatoes. Thank God, Brett. <laughs> And I think he's the he's not the guy that should be going out there fighting Rotten Tomatoes. Why do you hate Brett? You know, it's not that I hate Brett. I think that if you want to take a stand against something, you can't be the one who's beaten up by it all the time. It should be somebody who, like, does well on Rotten Tomatoes. Who's Has like, he ever made a good movie, Brett Ratner? Rush Hour 1? <laughs> okay. Then we're on to something. <laughs> okay. But, I mean, like, he, he's pissed at Rotten Tomatoes saying he thinks it's ruining the film industry. Because, it's already uh, ruined. The film industry is ruined. <laughs> he, he says that when a movie gets a negative, too low of a percentage, people just won't go see the movie. It is true. And then people say to me, you got to see this movie. It got 91%. I don't even know what that fucking means. It's got 91%. What is this? Uh, right. School? A lot of bloggers are talking about this movie, Ron. <laughs> They're loving it. <clears throat> I hate the guy that reviews uh, movies in my cab. I hate that guy. Fucking Sandy Kenyon. I don't like him. Put it out there. The only, uh, the only one that I, the only thing that I watch is um, talking pictures because I find uh, it's on New York well, One and it's like hilarious personalities. And again, no, none of the time am I thinking like, oh, thank God they warned me that movie isn't good. Like I'm probably from a trailer or just hearing about the premise of a movie, I'm going to decide whether or not I want to see it. But again, you can pick out one of those people and they're just having conversations about movies. Um, you brought up the fact there is a smart reason not to read reviews before because they just give it away now. Yeah. They it's, give it the fuck away. I, I noticed that because, like I said, I read reviews after I see a movie because I'm interested in what people are saying about it. 
And I'm always shocked. Like, if I would have read this before, I would have been furious. Yeah. And it's like, it's not even something where it's like, oh, a little bit of a, you know, a, it'll be something like 45 minutes into a movie, an hour into a movie, and they're giving away like a major plot turn. Mm-hmm. But if you're like, why would you do that? Don't trailers ruin enough? You know, like the trailers are terrible. Trailers are the worst. I mean, that was like my biggest problem with Get Out. Like, I wish that I had seen that movie without knowing anything about it, because watching the trailer, I'm pr- I pretty much got ninety five percent of the movie, and I don't know why. I mean, they were showing. You know, I went back and rewatched the trailer. Like, am I crazy? Did I see most of this stuff? And they were showing moments from like the last scene. The nice guys did that. The last thing that the characters say to each other in the nice guys is in every single trailer. And another the, another movie that did that this last year was Manchester by the Sea had probably the most dramatic moment of the movie where the two characters have kind of, uh, you know, a, a breakdown and they're yeah. crying. And that's the, what you see in the trailer. And so when that scene started, I thought, OK, like now it's going to get really intense. But they really showed the most intense moment of that conversation, which was a heartbreaking moment. But the punch was completely pulled because I knew exactly what she was going to say. And I knew how he was going to respond to it. Don't watch trailers then. I know. I like the 1930s trailers where they're just like, James Cagney is in this movie, and so is this <laughs> Maureen <laughs> LaPera. <laughs> that was such a great impression. Of it. But they should, the trailer should be like this Jaws. <laughs> it bites people until it gets blown up. <laughs> Wait, what happens? <laughs> you, heard me, this movie. you heard me, the shark gets blown up. You son of a bitch. <laughs> Jaws. You'll cry when Quint dies. What? Jaws. <laughs> the Godfather, the nice son, ends up being the gangsterest gangster of them all. <laughs> and Sonny gets killed in a, in a cold oh room. Shit. Oh, Sonny. Sonny. <laughs> oh, no. Good fellas. Joe Pesci will make you laugh. Until he gets shot in the back of the head <laughs> when he no. thinks he's getting his button. <laughs> oh, and the coke scenes will make you edgy. <laughs> I kind of miss those like late eighties, early to mid nineties trailers that were like the like the happy movie voice. Like there was like when Sally moved to New York. <laughs> She never knew that she'd find love. When did we stop doing that? Like one day, they just stopped Boom. doing that. Having a, like the narration throughout the trailer. They would always play that. Um, what's the fucking name of that song? The Peter Gabriel song? Yeah, the Peter Gabriel <laughs> song. Salisbury Hill? Yeah. <laughs> yes, in every trailer. Every trailer was Salisbury Hill. It was like that and let my love open the door. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's, it's, a a perfect, that. it's a perfect trailer song. Because you hear that song and you're like, I'm going to enjoy this. And I might bring my mom. This is going to be happy. (laughs) People are going to fall in love. Moving to New York. (laughs) Life, love. I don't know. I just need a chance to start over. (laughs) And look, she brought her dog with her, too. Sometimes people are in their mid-30s before they find a family, a family that they created. (laughs) I just need a chance to create a family. They don't realize that they're in love because they met cute. (laughs) Welcome to Salisbury Hill. (laughs) Salisbury Hill. And so finally, she let her love open the door. <laughs> Come on, Chris. We gotta have the other one, too. Coming soon, Salisbury Hill. It's, it's a place in Brooklyn that's really nice with fresh fruits and vegetables. She worried that she was too fat to find a boyfriend. But guess what? A really good-looking guy who's a lawyer went out with her. I don't know, guys. Am I too fat to meet you? (laughs) Fatty falls in love. (laughs) You see me beyond my fat. 
Sometimes love comes after dessert. <laughs> She's a little girl here from Trinidad. <laughs> Moved to the big city. He's got a dirty shirt, Ned, and a new Tinder account. I can relate to this movie. Swipe left. Coming soon. I don't even remember the last time I went to a theater. I fucking despise movies now. I used to love movies. Get Out was my last theater experience. And it was a really fun theater experience, despite the fact that I knew everything that was going to happen. The only thing that has me still going to theaters is that now a lot of them let you pick your seat before you get there. Oh my god, who cares about that? <laughs> I like that a lot. Seriously. I love that. Seriously. I could pick an aisle seat. Who fuck it has, Most of the time I go to the movie, I'm there by myself anyway. I need that aisle seat. I've never struggled over an aisle seat in the theater. I can't risk being I can't risk being at the front. I don't want to get there. I used to get to the theaters like forty five minutes before the movie started. And stop stand. going to opening weekends. I don't like spoilers like you. Whatever. Why can't you guys become friends? We just can't run. We bump into each other in the office. Hey, did you much. see Chandler Bing in the hall? Yes, I did. Do you see him, Gil? I did. I got to walk past him. He's got a very unique look now, huh? Yeah, he does. Didn't realize he so he was so tall. Well, Chris, I, was like, I can't sit around and measure everybody for you. <laughs> I was just like, who I did you I... said you saw the other day that you didn't know that they were that tall? Oh, uh, Katie Holmes. I had no idea that she was. Yeah, she's so tall. Tall. I never because there's something about her look that she seems petite. Like she's got like right. a little face, and I just always assumed that she was kind of like a short to medium height woman. She's very tall. Yeah, she's tall and slender. Remember when uh, the country got obsessed with her daughter? Like, whatever oh, you turn on, yeah, that little girl would be on TV all the time, or there would be pictures of her in magazines. Yeah, they were obsessed with getting the first picture of her, and they were trying to get pictures of her with the kid in the window of, like, a, of like the home. There was paparazzi outside the house at all times. So she used to go take gymnastics at Chelsea Piers, and I remember there would be days where she they'd bring her in through the back because paparazzi found out she went there, and there were two days we were on the basketball court, the door bursts open. You see like a security guard have a jacket over her and just cameras like flashing everywhere. That's weird for a little kid. That's she, up she walked into like a, an eighth grade field trip of a bunch of kids playing basketball and they were all running towards her <laughs> at that moment. She's just standing there like petrified because she's like, she doesn't really, I don't think she goes out much. Oh my Aww. God. Just hearing this story is nuts. This it's is, terrible. it's like it she doesn't was. doesn't even make sense, the story that he's telling. <laughs> I used to see her all the time. Born a princess. <laughs> now, when you said that they, they found out, does that mean you tipped off TMZ? No, I didn't tip off <laughs> TMZ. How much did you I didn't tip shit off. They, they actually had to buy blinds at Chelsea because the paparazzi were getting so bad. With you her. still work there? Yeah, on the weekends, I still do parties. <laughs> What? Children's parties, though. Someone right? just tweeted me just today. Neil Rosen got uh, laid off from New York One, along with two other longtime New York One staffers. What? How could they? It's insane. Mm. I don't care for that at all. No, I'm done with them now. <laughs> who else is out of there? I don't know who else. <laughs> John Sh uh, Shumo and Shelly Goldberg also Shumo? out. Shumo? It's S C H I U M O. Yeah, what does Shelly do? She's like the blonde, older woman. God no. damn it. They don't know a good thing when they have it. It's Spectrum. Spectrum's fucking cutting fucking heads left and right. Fucking Spectrum. It's the worst thing ever happened to me. It really Scumbag is. Kid. And I, I lived through the fucking AIDS crisis. They turned my internet off over the weekend, <laughs> and then they call. my mom calls, and she goes, I don't have any cable or internet. They go... Oh, you didn't see that commercial that said you have to change your box by this day? And they just shut us down. I didn't change mine. I didn't change mine either. We haven't changed ours in like six years. Mm. I don't even have a cable box. Ooh. Um, Cut the cord. <laughs> hey, uh, Robert. Robert, what's choice. up? <laughs> yeah, hey, Ron, Gail. Uh, hey. You're, talk you're talking about the uh, voiceover. Uh, I don't know if y'all ever saw a movie with Lake Bell. It's a cute little independent sort of movie, small in movie where, it, yeah, in a world uh, yeah. where they're all fighting for uh, vying for that job. It's it's pretty pretty cute movie. Pretty yeah, I like it. Too. I, like, I like Lake Bell a lot. I find her to be crazy sexy. Yeah, she's got a cool vibe about her too. Like yeah. she's just like she seems like a unique person. Um, but yeah, that was a good movie. It's just about voiceover artists. Uh. Reverend Billy C. Wirtz, 
How are you? Hey, hey, man. How are you? Cool. Great. Um, I love this. I love Joe. Yeah, it's good. And uh, I was just calling. You were talking about the uh, Southern Rock. Yeah. And uh, well, I'm down here in Tampa, and you know the whole Southern Rock thing. You know the Almond Brothers actually started in Daytona. Absolutely. Um, weird story. I actually put the star on Mrs. Allen's Christmas tree about 10 years ago, about 15 actually years ago. All right. Um, yeah, they were, um, they're, they're, they're still, you know, kept the place down there. Um, are you, uh, you used to be in Tampa, didn't you? Yes, I did. I'm on WMNF down there. I've got a radio show down there on oh. NPR. Cool. And I, I play at Skippers all the time. All right, that's really cool, man. Thanks for calling us, dude. My pleasure, man. Great show, and uh, keep up the good work. Glad to see you made it up here to the Big Apple. All right, man. Take care of yourself. Uh, here's Steve. Steve in Alabama. Hey, you guys. Hey, that's a great um, prize. Eat a peach. Eat Greg a peach. Yeah. yeah, it's unbelievable. Signed by unbelievable. Greg Ullman. I know. Well, and it maybe I have a good story. My mom had a friend. My mom's from Atlanta and grew up in Atlanta and Savannah. And she had a friend who dated him, Greg Allman, in the, like the early 70s. And he was going over to her parents' house for like, it was either Christmas or Thanksgiving, just for like a dinner and maybe for a night. And there was an ice storm and they got stuck there. So he was there for multiple days. So I guess they said, <laughs> I don't know if he ran, the, the phones were out, everything was out. And I guess he maybe ran out of whatever he had. And they said he was just pacing from room to room. He was in like his underwear and a t-shirt. And they're, you know, a nice Southern fan like, Greg, can I get you anything? And he's just kind of grunting and <laughs> moving and moving around the house. And um, I guess that was the end of that relationship. But I always, I always laugh when I think of that picture of him in a family setting and basically shut in. No, I like the idea of it myself. I really do. I really think, uh, I really think it would make a nice movie. <laughs> it's the Bennington show on, uh, what science is now telling us is a Thursday. It's thirsty Thursday. That's what people call to what people uh, I say college students call it thirsty <laughs> Thursday. And I would say people into their mid to late twenties will also call it thirsty Thursday. You seem like a weirdo today. <laughs> I am a weirdo. <laughs> it's a weird thing to say. <laughs> Chris, do you call it Thirsty Thursday? Occasionally, I just did. I'll, I'll, hey, guys, it's Thirsty Thursday. I'll come in in the morning in the office. Guess what? It's Thirsty Thursday. You ready? You know? uh, Patrick. Patrick, what's up? Hey, boys. Yeah. Uh, sadly, I, I don't have any uh, Greg Allman stories, but yeah. I do know... <laughs> that, uh, you know, in the eight, late 80s and 90s, the one song that used to be played rather frequently during movie trailers was James Brown's I Feel Good. And I think Saturday Night Live might have done a little skit with that, too. Yeah, people did love that uh, song for a trailer. You need, like, a good, like, uh, you know, don't worry, like, things are going to be good in the end. Like, there's going to be a little something that happens in the second act, but don't worry. Everyone's going to get together in the end. I believe The Big Chill was the first movie that showed people doing dishes to Motown music. And then it pretty much happened to every movie after that. Yeah, that became one of those, like, cliche movie things that, like, only really happen in movies. And then it started, that kind of turned into the thing where remember that was like this weird trope of women dancing around the table usually to a motown motown song like drinking margaritas and like do like singing into a fucking salad spoon. yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> what? i know you're gonna be why are you acting like that why don't you fucking chill out it's just a song <laughs> I mean, like, how many times has that happened in your life where you're like, you throw on a song and then all your friends are singing and dancing to it? This is uh, making its way around the internet today. Apparently, George W. Bush was at Trump's inauguration and he was leaving after Trump's speech. He said to someone and was overheard, that's some weird shit. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh my god that is some weird shit all right so we uh brought up uh comedy 101 in uh at the moon tower we are currently filled on our comedy 101 list we're taking names for a standby list and also anyone with a badge will be able to get in without being on our list so if you get the badge to moon tower you can still get in, but the list that we've put together, we're already booked up. Very nice. So, Better nice. get that badge. That's nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Weird, Chris. It's my favorite movie. <laughs> well, let's talk about that tomorrow, shall we? Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. Let's get, let's, I'm going to give you time to get into that tomorrow. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, who drew this thing that you love, Gail? Uh, let's see. This was, uh, sent to me from, let me find it. This was Kevy Metal. Oh, that's clever. <laughs> Kevy Metal, uh, drew a picture of the Bennington show. And, uh, I don't know. You guys could decide. You think it's a nice little likeness of us? I think it looks exactly like us. <laughs> I like it a lot. Yeah. Chris, Chris looks like Beaker. <laughs> That's cool. Chris, your neck beard situation is really intense. Just like in real life. <laughs> so it's accurate. I mean, it almost is a no neck situation. <laughs> and then Vito always does where his hat over his eyes like that. Yeah. I'm also a foot short of Chris. <laughs> like in real life. I think this is supposed to show depth of some sort, yeah. I think. No, he's standing right next to me in this picture. I can tell. <laughs> He's got a neck beard going too. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of in Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, The Four Thieves. That's what it looks oh, like. Oh, yeah, and it does. <laughs> Sparty. La, la. Sparty, what's up? Uh, I just got a Chris. Sure. Um, I was checking out the Facebook um, Instagram. And, um, there was a video of you checking out the in a lot. What's that, bro? Well, look, sometimes I just like to look at pictures of Jeffrey Gurian, and then Vito caught me doing that on the trip up to, <laughs> down to D.C. and put it on the Instagram. And the way back. Yeah, I, mean, I, I like to think is... about Jeffrey Gurian. I worry about the guy sometimes. <laughs> but it, it's kind of weird that you would zoom in so close on his face <laughs> and so? seem to get so much pleasure as you lovingly gaze at it. I don't think it's a problem. I don't know why people think it's weird. <laughs> but why the way back? <laughs> He wasn't even with us. No, no, but he called in yesterday. I was thinking about that. I know I'd be a call, <laughs> far coming that up with That was Jeffrey. before he called in. But the best thing is on the way back is Vito's camera work here is pretty phenomenal. Yeah. In which he catches it in the reflection <laughs> of the window of the train. We all love This Jeffrey was Gordon. actually a week ago that we were on that train coming back. For It feels like it was two days ago and two months ago. So so weird. I feel like that just happened. And I'm also going to say this. I feel like Chris needs a vacation because he's cracking up. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I really know that we're the last people to know that when we need a vacation. Uh -huh. But I'm noticing that Chris is cracking up. Yeah. I mean, the things he says and does get weirder by the day. And yeah. that should be our indicator. Okay. I'm like a litmus test for insanity. I wouldn't go that far. Okay, cool. But you're definitely, you know, we can gauge how how tired and weird we're getting. And then also that I, my health is falling apart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that too we could use as an indicator. Last night I had the chills like I was fucking dope sick. And I never get the chills unless I'm coming off of heroin. But I had that same feeling. And I'm just like freezing and sweating at the same time oh god that's horrible i know i don't know what that even means i think that you must have had a bad fever that night last night because i think every time that happens to me my instinct is always to take like a hot bath or get in the shower because my i can't get warm because my body temperature and i have chills but i think that's probably worse for you because what's actually happening is that you're like you have the chills because you're like fevery 
I just thought if I had a little taste of sister morphine, I'd feel a lot better. No. That's not going to help anything. Dope sick. <laughs> Dope sick. I like, I'm going to write a children's book called Dope Sick is the Worst Kind of Sick. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to Crazy Jen. She's pretty good at uh, writing kids' books. Damn, is she. She's got some great ones out right now. Yeah, I don't want this on my plate. Mi abuela es sick. <laughs> is sick. You added S when not necessary. S <laughs> sick. That thing got a little depressing. <laughs> it takes a dark turn. Oh, yeah. There's death. And then the other kids are toning her because their grandmother's dying. Yeah. It's terrible. And then I think she also wears a scarf on her head because she wants to be like grandma. Yeah, it was a scarf doll, right? Yeah, she. Uh, oh yeah, that's shaved her is. fucking doll's head. <laughs> yeah. Like Jesus Christ, <laughs> let kids be kids for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and then I tried to call up and get a uh, book signed in New York City, but they said it had to be longer than three pages. <laughs> Ronnie, it only has three pages. That's actually a pretty good impression. <laughs> I did. Uh, I did get some uh, tweets. Uh, when we played that, that they were having trouble because they were not in the audience telling when I was saying an exaggeration of her or when she was talking. Mm. She, uh, I think that's where I got the cold from. I think she just actually exhausted me. Yeah, she could have sucked the life right out of you. Ta just taken every ounce of strength you had. All right, we're going to uh, break here. Uh, Joe List is stopping in. This is Bennington. Back to Bennington. Oh, thanks. Robert Kelly and Joe Lister in studio. Oh, the Benefit Show Comedy for McKenzie is happening Tuesday, April 11th at 8 p.m. at the Village Underground featuring Bob Kelly, Joe List, Nick DePaul, and Mark Norman. Go to ComedyCellar.com for tickets. What, you, what is that? Oh, I'm here to promote Bananas this weekend. Oh, Bananas. I'm in Hasbro, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 um, I don't... I, is that what... <laughs> yeah, so anyways, it's a sick girl... <laughs> I got a kid too, Joe, and he needs banana money. I got a bonus on the line. I don't work for a flat rate. Come in, air, hotel, bing. I, if I put asses in the seat, my kid gets to go to that fucking Elmwood school one more semester and maybe have a shot. Also in studio, Andrew Dice Clay. Oh! <laughs> it's good to see you guys. What's up, man? And you're out doing charitable work, which is nice. That's well, so sweet. We all know about this charity. I kind of made a fucking disaster. I feel bad for every. You know, don't it's, ever, don't think twice. Well, you know, I don't took feel a, bad for charity. Oh, when you have people on the internet going, "You fat fucking piece of shit," you fucking. Scumbag, you know, I had a lot. Of I thought I thought what you did was nice. Was Wait, well, who called you? Why did they call you a fat? Because I, I kind of, I got too excited because I, I was a hurt child. I mean, you want to get into it? Yeah, sure. I'm Let's a hurt. I was a fucking hurt child. I had a very bad childhood, I, and and now having a kid, it's all coming up. And I remember all this pain, and 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 then when you said Joe, this girl, and blah, blah I was like, I, and I heard, and I just went nuts. I just want to help. I just want to help. If somebody could have helped me the way mm -hmm. I could try to help, and I went nuts, and then my show. And I was like, hey, guys, we could give in. And then I forced, you know, and everybody and everybody's a sweet person. And they gave their money except one person. And then. Um, but she's got her own kid. <laughs> yeah. I turned my show into a benefit, which apparently is a fucking bad thing to do. It is a bad thing. It's terrible. But you know what? You no, know what? I think it was sweet. And I think everybody enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, it was a, a really nice gesture. Well, that's why yeah. you, you, when you were. You said it, you know, you, yeah. you were very hesitant when but you were. But you were, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know. The, and I, I, I give track, you a hard time about I it. I tracked those emails down, and they went right to your oh, house. So, there, so our was, lights got turned off that way, too. <laughs> it's really but sad. you were a hurt child, <laughs> physically or mentally hurt as a child? Were you physically oh, hurt? Or? You know what's weird? What do you... Uh, tell us, <laughs> gave me the don't get into this. 
<laughs> well, I just know I know some of the stuff. I was physically. Yeah. Mentally. I think if you're physically, mentally, they go hand in hand. Right. I right. think one hand of a punch mm-hmm. grabs the other hand of mentally and says, let's go for a ride. It right. was hand and fingers, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. I didn't get him molested. Oh. Right. That wasn't until, well, I did. But that was by a woman. So I don't know if that's molestation. Yeah, that is. That's the molestation. 100% is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, the blouse took took advantage of me in a, in a rhubarb bush. Yeah, they call it hot molestation is the medical term. <laughs> <laughs> it's called um, masturbatable molestation. <laughs> yeah, it's called... It, it's, you can find it on the internet as a category. Joe, your, your childhood was nice, though. Wonderful, yeah. Although I just started therapy, and this a few things went astray that I didn't realize. But mm. there was not, no no abuse, certainly. Like what? Like what? Well, I don't want to get into it uh, too much, but uh, you know, I was. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh my sorry, God. Bobby oh, passes yeah. out from being overweight sometimes. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm, um, I just had. I'm hungry. Yeah. Does anybody have a snack? Is there a snack? I thought you guys. <laughs> Joe, I had a great childhood, but something went wrong. Yeah, a few, a few things <laughs> yeah. went to right. Like one yeah. time when I was a kid, I failed off the track team. I yeah. failed a lot of classes, got kicked off the track team, and my mother she apologized to me for not paying closer attention, oh. which I'm finding out now is not, uh, you know, addressing the problem. So I never addressed problems, and then I felt that anything I'd fail, all my failures would be my mother's failures, which is actually quite a burden. I, yeah. I came home from school late in second grade because I was so happy I got Miss Julian We're back that to my stepfather punched me down a flight of stairs. Oh. No, you go, Joe. <laughs> track team, go. <laughs> yeah, so anyways, I failed off the track team, and it was very painful for me yes. to be... Thrown off, uh, emotionally painful to be thrown off a track team. I mean, K- sir, no one punched me downstairs. K- came yes. out of a room one time, very happy, a little <laughs> TV, and my sister had a cord, a telephone cord wrapped around her head, and I saw the, f- the, the phone part get thrown at her fucking face, and then my mother said, don't, and then he punched her. She buckled over and went, oh, like a boxer, and, uh, and then dragged me into the room, and then I tried to hold the door back, and he kicked it through and slammed me against the wall, and then I slid down and played dead for the first time. That's where my acting ability apparently came from. Go, Joe! That reminds me of the time my I came home, and they were playing pickle in my front yard, and I went, I'm playing too! And then my dad turned and looked. The ball hit me right in the forehead, and uh, it was really quite a bruise. I didn't have to go to the hospital or anything like that, but uh, yeah. I had the ice for some time. Yeah. Uh, that reminds me of the time when, <laughs> yeah, uh, I walked in and my mother was divorcing my stepfather and he was actually basically, I think, raping her in the room. And she went, Bobby, go. And then I cried and called my Uncle Tommy and Jimmy and they came over and stopped it. Go, Joe. That's hilarious. I mean, that's funnier than anything I can name, to be honest. <laughs> go ahead. Ron, are you mad at me? I'm getting a bad vibe. No, no, no. I'm All enjoying right. this. I feel like I got a haphazard hello and um, just no, I got, I got a, I have an eye. I felt an eye. No. <laughs> he's but, not well. It's really yeah, like, he's, I'm not he's well. He's not been greeting I'm people. I'm very, very sick. You sound nasally. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, thanks for announcing that when we walked in and <laughs> yeah. fucking hugged and smooched you. Well, well, that's not the type of thing that you can catch, okay? Hot, what what oh. I have, you know what I mean, can't be caught. I'm so sorry. I've yeah. you, can, Your medical, medical degree, where was that yeah. from? Uh, I got it from Yale. Yale. I, went to Yale. I forgot that you were. Yeah. A, you could diagnose yourself because <laughs> you know exactly what you but have. You know what? Now you see why your stepfather used to beat you because it's just too much after well, a while. Okay, all right. Well, you know, you, you, know? Got, you make a good point. Apparently, you have a psychology degree. <laughs> Too. <laughs> all over the fucking place. Why, why are you just holding it back to this show? <laughs> Let's plug along what the great work that these guys are doing. Robert Kelly and Joe Lister. Bananas. This. Oh, sorry. The <laughs> Benefit Show, Comedy for McKenzie, is happening Tuesday, April 11th at 8 p.m. at the Village Underground. Go to ComedyCellar.com for tickets. And Bobby's going to be at Bananas and Bananas Comedy Club in New Jersey this weekend. Hey, this this is a great cause, though. This girl, uh, Joe, tell her about what happened, how this came about. Tell her? Tell everybody, the world. Um, well, what happened was uh, a gentleman... You really uh, can't tell her. A, ge- <laughs> a gentleman emailed me and just said, hey, I'm a big fan of your podcast. I love your podcast more than Bobby's. Yeah. And he said it was really just what? a great... Wait, whoa, whoa. I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have left that part out. Oh, but okay. he just said uh, he's a big fan. And he said, you know, his daughter, Mackenzie, has... Uh, I don't. To be honest, I don't remember. I, I only read it once because it made a, me emotional. It's a pediatric part. cancer. Yes. It's, it's uh, one of the worst ones. It's very rare. 
and she has it. And it's it's devastating. It's aggressive, and it's one of these things with uh, it costs thousands of dollars a month to keep her, you know, um, as healthy as she can be. Beautiful little girl. And um, so, anyways, I decided we should we should try to get some some money to the guy and uh, to the family to her. And uh, so we're doing the show, and he's a big fan of everyone on the show. So uh, we put it together, and it's at the Village Underground. They've been unbelievable and helpful, uh, and uh, I think we're gonna have some. Yeah. Cool things to auction off or whatever. Uh, we're gonna have some special guests, I think. I hope. Yeah. And uh, Robert will be there, of course. DePaulo, Mark Normand, and uh, myself. Great and show, raising money. All the we raised thousands of dollars from the Creeps for Kids show that went to this family too. <clears throat> I haven't heard anything from the family. Thank you. Nothing. But, <laughs> not even a fucking tweet. But listen, but the thing the, is, money get there yet? <laughs> There's a check waiting. It's not. It's there. It's. I'm sorry. It's not liquid. What did you want? Cash? What are they in the mob? What is this? A fucking casino in in, in fucking Tampa? Well, if they haven't got it yet, maybe that's why there's no thank you yet. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. I'm just saying that you know we could you know you know um, maybe a DM something. Mm. Um, <laughs> Anyways, we raised a lot of money from this show, and this show is going to raise a lot of money. And I want to say that your fans, your fans, are, yes. are, are just the best. Yeah, they're very. You guys nice. have great fans. Yeah, and they 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 went to the GoFundMe. Yeah, and they 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 hit that up too that night from the Creeps with Kids. So now this show they'll do the same thing. Yeah, speaking of the fans and uh, raising money, we're only raising money if fans come to the show. So come to the show. April 11th. Huh? Otherwise, there won't be any money. <laughs> well, if they come to the show, but they can also go to the GoFundMe and, and, and donate that way, too. They can do that, but if you just did that, we'd be telling jokes to an empty room, and that would actually hurt our feelings, and that would probably have to raise a few bucks for us. But we're not. it's going to sell out. Isn't it already sold, almost sold out? Well, we have to encourage them to come. They might say, hey, it's already sold out. I'm well, saying, this that type of negativity and, and, and two mewling quims on the air aren't helping sales. Well, we're not here to just tell them how great we are. we got to get them to come. come well, we got to say they were great. Who wants to go see a shit show? Come to the show, everybody. April 11th, Bobby was punched in the face by his dad. And he, Joe yeah. List, was actually, he was kicked off a track team, <laughs> which I don't even know if that's possible. I think he just quit. It wasn't you, you had off. a discussion with the teacher, and you were like, all right, pull the hammy. Well, maybe you should just, all right, I mean, it's cool with you. And they're like, yeah, it's cool. Come back whenever you want. Now Joe, you're, you're in therapy. I got kicked off the track team. What was your event in track? Oh, I re you name it, I ran it. Mm. I ran the 400 meter relay. I was on the B squad. I ran once the mile. Around, that's once around the track. I can do that. <laughs> once around the track. Fump one time. Boom. I'm in. No, I did it. I won, quickly. buddy. I won it in sixth grade. <laughs> All right, Mr. DePerzio. Kelly, I want you to go win it. And I was. That was my first fat. That was Kelly's first. This my first fat. Mr. DePerzio said, Kelly, I want you to win it. And I went out and I beat two black kids and a Puerto Rican <laughs> once around the track. Four hundred. I won that. I won it for Mr. D. For Mr. D at Brooks at Brooks. Okay, elementary school. That's terrific. I don't care for racial humor personally. <laughs> I ran Why? a mile. I, won, I beat a kid from Nosset, Massachusetts. Four minutes and 52 seconds, everybody. Buddy, I beat a fucking old guy from Narragansett. Yeah, but then he made you blow him. So <laughs> what the fuck does that part of the story have to do with anything? <laughs> April 11th, charity. I got, a, I got a big audition. Oh, yeah. Are you excited about That's your big I'm, audition? <laughs> That's why I'm dressed like uh, Kingpin. It's a very nice look. Yeah, you you like yeah, it's you a great jacket. Like Kingpin, though. I do. I look like yeah. Kingpin. What color would you guys say this coat is? I know we're on radio right I now. Would, I would call it a maroon. That's it's, what I said. Uh, it's browner than a normal maroon, Thank though, you. right? It's like, a, it's like a red brown. Yeah. But it shimmers. It has a little shimmer. Yeah, there yeah. is a shine to it. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's, um, it's a very attractive jacket, though. It is an attractive jacket. It's a custom-made jacket for me, <laughs> yeah. which shows me that when it used to fit eight months ago, <laughs> and then I've been on the road since then because the show got canceled, you know, and I made food my friend, Yelp. Me and Yelp had a fucking love affair for the last six months on the road, and now I can't button it. If you pay a thousand on the table right now, I wouldn't be able to button it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a custom made jacket, but we should note all of Bobby's clothes have to be customized. So April eleventh, <laughs> yes. We're at we're at the Village Underground raising it's gonna money. Be a big, it's gonna be a big yeah, night. It's, yeah, it's a benefit for Mackenzie. I'm yeah. blaming the nasal thing on that one because I feel like that was a hot line there. <laughs> yeah, it was a hot one. Ooh, yeah. Was it hot? Like a pile of doo doo. That might be the worst bomb I've ever had in the history of my life. <laughs> I think you worry too much, Joe. I really do. I, that's one of the things I'm in therapy for. Yeah. Track I mean, team. Yeah, you gotta. You just gotta let it go, buddy. Yeah, you gotta let it go. 
What's Would you say you're a high anxiety person? Oh, I'm a mess. Yeah, I got yeah. some problems. I got some panic problems and some anxiety and worry. And uh, when's the last time you had a panic attack? Recently, about yeah. uh, oh, about ten days ago, eleven days ago. It was yeah. horrifying. What, what what brought it on? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't you know. See a this... marathon go by. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. Well, you say because you ran track, and you know that made you feel off. bad when you were kicked oh, off I the see. team. Hey, you just tumbled out of control. Yeah. I could have been. <laughs> I don't see how that joke is better than my all your clothes well, are customized. You don't have joke. to. Everybody else did. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to get a discussion of why. <laughs> no. okay, I, I, look, I just go for the big. I go for the big laughs. All right. You go, Tell you the truth, I think the sick kid is coming in between you guys. You know what I mean? Well, you're, yeah, you used to you're be close. such good friends to the sick kid. Um, I don't know what brought in my panic. I had back to back weeks in condos where you couldn't sleep, and then I can't yeah. sleep, and then I go crazy. Yeah. And I've had a tooth problem, too. I had a root canal, and it's a bad root canal. And I keep going back to the dentist. I'm terrified of the dentist. I had a panic attack in the dentist chair. It's wow. Do you don't think the de dentist is terrified of you when you show up? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was mean. That was mean. I shouldn't have said that. He said, I have great teeth. He said, they're very healthy. Who said that? Who's the your dentist? dentist? Louis J. Gomez? <laughs> you have great teeth. They're better than mine. Mine are dead from the ba from the middle back all the way to the front. Smell them? Ha! Ah. I think the key to success in an audition is getting there early. <laughs> wow. Jeez, you have to hurt my feelings, man. I'm just fucking trying to get a couple what, What's the part about? You feel like you got it down? Yeah, well, I think we, we and Joe rehearsed it on the way. We yeah. rehearsed it on the way. Bobby made me read his sides and lines while walking through busy downtown Manhattan. I'm not, I'm not Hitler. I didn't have a, a little <laughs> gun to the back of your fucking skull. I asked as a friend, <laughs> could you help me? Because I'm, you know. I came in to try to go and meet you, and then I, you know, there was a lot of traffic. I was in traffic for an hour and a half to come meet you, and then I was like, "Can you help me read?" And then you said, "Yeah." Okay. How did it go though, Joe? Did it seem like uh, you think, he you think he's got it? I think he's got it. I think it's great. Yeah. I think Bobby's a tremendous actor and just a genuinely good friend and a good guy. And I like mm -hmm. his coat, and I think he's sweet. I well, you you like my coat now because it's the first thing you said out of your mouth. Are you doing magic now? <laughs> Well, That's do, the first thing you said. You yeah. have a magician look. What? Yeah. what and the then I, never, what fat magician is there? Uh, Penn and Teller. Isn't one of them fat? I think he got skinny. No. Yeah, whatever. he got very thin. He, dro he did. Sorry. He dropped he the LBs. Got, yeah. LBs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Millennial. Yeah. Millennials. <laughs> they love it. They love it. I, I think Joe, Joe is one of my favorite people in the world. And yeah, I can this tell is, that today. I'll tell you, I swear to God, yeah. literally, one of the funniest guys working the planet. Thank you. One of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. One of the most sensitive, caring people in this business. And that's all I got about him. But there's no buts. There's no buts. There's not a but about uh, Joe. And then I also said, um, remember I asked, um, where'd you get your coat? Gays are us. That was funny. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe 10 years ago that was funny, but yeah. not with this president. Well, it's similar to... Um, <laughs> yeah. I might want to watch your fucking piece of news. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the gay. You want to go on an apology tour? You and Tracy Morgan? Go ahead. I, I love... It's called uh, homosexuality. What do you mean P's and Q's? Pussies and queers? What the <laughs> fuck are you doing? There's a kid at stake here. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get back to the kid. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you yeah. Feel, Bobby, I know you got to go. I want you to get this thing, though. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll let you know if I get it. Yeah. I'm probably not going to get it. The odds of getting an audition are, f are fucking a million to one. It's just ridiculous. There's too many actors. There's back in the day, there was movie actors and TV actors. So if you went for TV and you're you you'd, you'd have a shot. And in New York City, there wasn't that many. You know, it was what thirty something shows. Now there's seven six hundred shows on TV. So and all these movie guys said, "Fuck it, I don't make money as the co co lead. I'm a great actor, but I, I make what." You know, scale or, you know, a hundred thousand. I'll come to TV. I book a TV show. I become a star if it's a hit and I'm getting paid a hundred thousand dollars an episode. That's fucking a week, you know? Mm. So now it's the, the competition is so crazy. The only time you ever really get a role is if they want you to, if they're like, Oh, we liked him from something, which is a double edged sword. It's like getting into the actors union. Right. You can't get in unless you did something in SAG, but you can't be in SAG. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so. It's it's the same thing, you know. You have to want, but luckily, I know a couple people involved with this. So hopefully, I don't think they're going to be there today. But hopefully, but there is a big producer, so uh, which it always freaks me out. What so, kind of role is it? Um, I play I play a fat gay guy. 
Oh, nobody type sh- guess. Nobody sh- <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It just seems like type. Because I know what happened with now, your step. Now, how long have you been a method actor? <laughs> you know what? First of all, first of all, well, he's not, you know, that's the one thing, too. You, How do you, you know, you get asked the question, I mean, how gay is this guy? Right. You know, which, which modern family gay guy is he? Right. Is he the redhead or is he the chubby guy? It's two different, you know. Two different ways to go with two it. Two different ways, Ronnie. Yeah, two different thing. choices you can mm-hmm. make. Different Chris, business. Not plug no, this for the Ken- plug. Yeah. For Mac- this is for Mackenzie. Robert Kelly and Joe Lister in studio. The Benefit Show Comedy for Mackenzie is happening Tuesday, April 11th at 8 p.m. at the Village Underground. Performing will be Robert Kelly, Joe List, Nick DiPaolo, and Mark Norman. Yes. Go to ComedyCellar.com for tickets. Yeah, and if you want to this weekend before then, you know. Bananas, Comedy Club. Bananas, for one show Friday, though. That's where I'm at. All right, yeah. Friday. Bananas. But do you... Uh, Too shabby. Do you feel like DiPaolo <laughs> should be doing this show for the kid? Absolutely. Okay. You know, it's funny. DePaulo is I. You know, I'm 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 a big fan of his podcast now. Yeah, he's very funny. And as far as stand up goes, it's on. He is fucking. He's untouchable. He is a machine. Yeah. When he goes on stage, the jokes are so so precise and good. And his point of view, whether you agree with his point of view or not, I do agree though. <laughs> we all. That's we the thing. All, I agree hundred percent. We all do. We all do. Yes. But yeah, I just saw him last night. Yeah. Do a, an impression of his mom going into a swimming pool, and I've been laughing for fucking <laughs> since the second I saw it. Not that you're not funny too, Joe. Uh, don't you. let the anxiety get to you. You're I'm very a, funny. I'm a little in my head. I feel like everyone's mad at me, to be honest. Why, why do you say things like that? You've done that every once in a while when you come in. Well, I just feel like I know it's probably the cold, but I feel like I'm still getting a cold, a, a separate cold vibe. Uh-huh. From you personally, yeah. Uh, Bobby hurt my feelings a couple times. That's okay, I, I, but I love you. But I agree with you. I think Ronnie's being cold to you today. <laughs> I just I have a problem with you, and I don't want to go into it today. Right. But I've had no. a couple things I heard you say about me, and <laughs> I'll get to the bottom. Of hey, that. man. On that note, yeah. I should go. You should go. I should take off yeah. and let you guys work this good out because you. Ron, me and you are good. Oh God, are we good? <laughs> what? I love to. <laughs> Do shows seriously. Every show I do, I want to do with you. No, I'm the same way. I just can't. Let's I'm raise the same money. Way. Yeah. I don't even care about. Let's give the money away. Yeah. I, Ronnie. Yeah. Hey, what are you doing this weekend? Uh, want to come out to Bananas and do a spot? I would. If I you would want come. to, everywhere I'm playing, just walk on. I will. It'll walk be like in. Bob don't Hope. Don't even Tyson. ask. Yeah, you're the best. All right, go knock and, this thing out. Come on, Gail. Yeah. The best. I yeah. mean, me yeah. and you. Yeah. I she's the, I, you said such a good kid. If my kid could be as good as this kid, yeah. God damn it. I love the whole. St- I love everybody. Uh, we love it. you. Uh, we love you. I see you Robert later. Kelly. There he goes. Break a leg. See you guys later. He's hey, Joe. Be bananas. So, maybe we'll see you after. We'll have a bat. <laughs> All right. Whatever. I mean, cool. All right, Mackenzie. This weekend. No, I'm kidding. Joe, Tuesday. <laughs> Joe, list everybody. It's Tuesday. It's not this weekend. Bananas. Bananas. This weekend. No, I just wanted to hear you say it. Um, no, Joe, list everybody. And my yeah, best friend. Joe One of my best friend. At least. Thank you, everybody. At least ten people are going. Oh fuck, Mackenzie! We'll go to Bananas. Well, well, I mean, those ten people when they go to Bananas this weekend, I'll tell you to go to Mackenzie's. How about this? If you hit your bonus, you give the bonus to Mackenzie, huh? That's something. Yeah. All right, I'll see you guys later. See you later. <laughs> there he goes. Wish me luck. Good this luck, dear buddy. Life. This is it. You gotta hurry. It's hundred thousand a week, minutes. buddy. Hundred thousand. Thank you. Well, yeah, you know, I'm up to fifty. All right, I'll there you, you go. Later. Bye. There he goes. There he goes. The banana. I think he's got it. it. <laughs> I think I he's got tell. it too. We, we we had lines and he really has it down. I, I got to be honest, a f- quite a few lines he d- didn't say it right. Right. Okay. But he was in the thing, so I felt like yeah, yeah. Did he? Let him. Did he modify his voice any? Put a little affectation on it? A little bit, but Bobby has a gayness to him. Right. Honestly, <laughs> I don't even mean that. He's very, uh, you know, he does a lot of. Flip these and yeah. I don't want to disparage. <laughs> no, that's you said what needed to be said. <laughs> he's, a, now, he's a colorful Chris, person. You do your gay character, right? Yeah, it sounds like this. <laughs> See, that's, oh, that's offensive. Gonna... What's wrong? That's no. offensive. That is I like dick. <laughs> yeah. Okay, oh that's God. too much. Yeah, it's really offensive. Oh my God. You know, I like for the lots list, of it. listening audience, he was flailing his limp wrist around in a very old school fashion. Like, fill me up. <laughs> Oh God! Oh, God. Jesus, on. horrific! This show is no, a character. Nobody yeah. says that. This show's changed a little Wait, bit. Wait, don't blame the whole show on no, him. No, that's that's him. wrong. It's just Joe, my character. Right? That's my character. Yeah, show. but it's, uh, it's almost like if a Muslim goes into a place and kills somebody, it doesn't mean all Muslims are bad. That's yeah. true. You know, I thought you agreed with Nick. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I really do agree with Nick on every political idea that he has. Yeah, he's changed you. Yeah, he woke me up. I'm finally woke. I'm finally woken up. Woke. Uh, Joe List so funny on our uh, on our street joke show. That too. was the best night of my life. Yeah. Was it wasn't really. I don't know if it's the best night of my life, but I think it's the funniest I've ever been on a thing. Which I hope no one's wow. listening. Going, boy, Joe List sucked that night. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. I felt really proud of the work we did that night. I felt like it was a really good show. You're a very very funny man, as you know. Oh well, thank you. Now, uh, Vito, do you do a gay character? Uh, I could, I could, like, hey, everybody, like, my name's Vito. And All right, see, that's better than Yeah, Chris. I mean, less That's better than this one. I'm Dick progressive, man. and I don't Dick. yell out stuff about sucking penises. All right. Oh, boy. This is my gay character. Yeah. Hi, everybody, I'm Joe. And, yeah. um, oh, my God, you're so progressive. I prefer the company of men. <laughs> <laughs> that is, seriously, that's seriously progressive. It's unbelievable. Yes. It really yeah. is. Do you it's, remember, a, it's an unbelievable character. Yeah. Remember that Simpsons where uh, Homer's friend is gay, and Marge is trying to tell him, and she goes, Homer, he prefers the company of men. He goes, well, who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it really is true of most uh, guys that they would rather hang out with guys. Yeah. I prefer the company of women, so it Do makes you? sense. Yeah. <laughs> I think most women have more guy friends than they have women friends, in my experience. I used to. Yeah. Like, when I was maybe, like, high school to college age, mm. I had far more male friends. Yeah. Very few female friends. A couple close female friends. But now I'm back to the opposite. Yeah. I, hard. I don't like having friends. I like having work acquaintances. That's yes. my favorite thing. Like, mm. oh, we're doing some work. And you don't judge by gender on that. You can have no, work I don't. That's acquaintances right. yes. of male or female variety. I like to have a project going on between adults. I don't like to... Well, because I don't take drugs and drink. When I used to take drugs and drink, it was easy to hang out with people. Right. Because you would be working on drinking and drugs. Yeah, yes. there's like a thing to do. Ooh. I remember when I first got sober, I was about to get sober. I wanted to get sober. I was talking to my, our friend Gary Gullman, and I said, but what do I do? He was trying to convince me that sobriety is better. Not that he's sober, but he's not an alcoholic. And he said, well, I said, what do I do when I'm at a party with a bunch of people I hate? And then he said, uh, you go home. And it blew my mind. I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. I have to be out with people I hate. I was like, no, you don't. You go home. And now I went too far. And now everyone tells me I isolate too much. Oh, you do isolate. I'm trying to balance. But you know what I think is very good about you, Joe? Like, if you're uncomfortable, you say. Like, you thought that I was giving you a bad vibe and I wasn't nice to you when you came in. I was... Focusing yes. on Bobby, I noticed that also. I thought uh, I thought that that was a very healthy thing that yeah. you stated. Oh. That. you got it out there. Oh, good. Oh, that, you know? that's good. I so probably would never do something like if I felt a weird thing, I would never go, "Hey, everybody, I feel weird about this moment." Right? Am I right to feel weird about it or not? Yeah, but sometimes but I do good. it too much because then I'm just uh, relying on other people to say, "No, you're great," and it just continues the uh, problem. I need to figure these out on my own. Um, so you're saying that other people won't be honest with you. Maybe when you, when you say that, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what I got. I got. I've had two therapy sessions and uh, really diving back into other things and trying to get the head straight. You know. Do you have a, a male therapist, female therapist? I have a male therapist. Yeah. What do you think works better? I've had uh, female therapists. I've only gotten a female therapist. I feel like I wouldn't be. I wouldn't feel comfortable talking to my problem. But my problem my female so therapist got too attached. Oh yeah. really? Yeah. Ooh. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Was a, I've only had female therapists. Yeah. I've had one female, one male. And both have been extremely helpful. But sometimes all I need is someone to go, Yeah, that's this. You have this thing. And then I go, right. Oh, all right. Because yeah. I'm always afraid I'm losing my mind and going crazy. And they say, No, that's you have panic disorder. You have yes. anxiety. You're you're uh you feel alone though. And you go, Oh, okay, great. See you later. Do you know that people that are losing their mind or are crazy? don't think the way you do. They don't say, I'm crazy. They just think it's normal. Uh -huh. So just yeah. by saying, I think I'm going crazy, means that you're not going crazy. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that is good. That's like uh, Catch-22. Yes, exactly. The great book by Joseph Conrad. I don't think it was by Joseph. It's no. Joseph Heller. Oh, yes. Right? Joseph Heller also <laughs> wrote that book. Um, they worked on it together? He had a pen name. Chris, you're not uh, plugging All this right. thing for the no, kid? No, Joe. 
I apologize. Apologies to Mackenzie. Joe List is in studio. The Benefit Show, Comedy for Mackenzie, is happening Tuesday, April 11th at 8 p.m. at the Village Underground. Robert Kelly, Joe List, Nick DePaul, and Mark Norman are on the show. Go to ComedyCellar.com for tickets. And we're working on other people. Hopefully we'll have some other uh, people drop by and stop in and yada yada. Colin Quinn was originally on the show, but he has a uh, obligation, but he did donate quite a chunk of money, and I feel like I just want to say that out loud because he's a wonderful man. He is a wonderful man, That's isn't sweet. he? Tremendous human being, yeah. Yeah. He's, um... He's a better guy than he ever lets on. He's very, very helpful to people. Yes, he is. Um, speaking of helping things out, I know sometimes we come on here, we talk, I talk about motion pictures, mm -hmm. film. Yes. I saw a film called Personal Shopper. Have you guys seen it? No. Kristen Stewart. It's a thriller, horror, ghosty thing. Yeah. And uh, it's a pretty good movie. And uh, this is for all the heterosexual men out there. She gets extremely naked in the film and then <laughs> masturbates. And it's one of the hottest. It's, it's, I, I'm not a big porn guy. Yeah. But it inspired me. I'm like, maybe I should get into porn. This is really turning me upside down. Now, did you see it in the theater, the movie? I saw it in the theater on the Upper West Side. It was 11 yeah. elderly people because it was a daytime Upper West Side. And they were all sitting well in front of me. So I did have a moment of, hey, I think I could, you know, masturbate here if I wanted to. Sure. I, I did it because, you know. I think that in every movie. I think you could also <laughs> extend that invitation out to the ladies who enjoy the company of women. Because they are very into her. That's a good point. Yeah, they're very into her right now. I didn't she, mean to be yeah. all Chris Stanley close-minded up here. I understand. But, um, but she's so also a terrific actor. Yes. And a lot of people don't realize that because she was in the, whatever the movie the was. Movies. Yeah, the vampire. Teen Wolf. Twilight. Yeah. <laughs> Twilight. And some people are like, no, she's not. But I've seen her in other stuff. I'm like, oh, she's really good. She's tremendous in this movie. It's yeah. like a really great performance. She's also in Into the Wild, small part, but really Love good in that. Yeah. Love her in that. And I saw her in this other French film not too long ago that I thought she was crazy good in. Um, Gail, your aunt has like a nutty crush on her. She does, yeah. Yeah. Oh, fun. She's like really into it. The ladies like her a lot. The ladies do dig her. Well, she's very good, but she's extremely uh, sexy in this film particularly. Any reason that she starts to masturbate uh, just when she's personally shopping? She. <laughs> No, she's not. It's not while she's shopping. She's yeah, okay. Not, she has. She's a personal shopper for a very. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but for this like <laughs> high end model, and she's mm. not allowed to wear her clothes. Ah. And then she decides to get naughty and put on the clothes, and then jerks off. Mm. And uh, it's really something else. But the movie itself, like I said, is great. Like even if you're not attracted to uh, women, you would enjoy the film. You should do Doug Love's movies. Have you ever done his show? No, but I thought that was like a pot show. You got to be all high. No, no, cooking. no. You don't have to be that. He, that's Doug get, getting high with Doug or something. Getting the other Doug one is just high. about right. movies. Oh, I see. And uh, he he does some movie trivia, and then you just you know talk about movies that you've seen. You'd be perfect for that yeah. show. I'd love to do it. I'm a big. Uh, Old school film fan. I'm having trouble. I know you go Great to movies movie. every every <laughs> week, right? You try I, to see a movie a week. I go a lot. I go because yeah. I'm on the road or whatever. Or I have time mm. to kill yada yada. So what's uh, what have what did you say other than this one? What's your favorite movie this year? Um, it's hard because I feel like I'm a I'm a bit of a movie uh, real. I'm a movie cunt. I really don't. Can I yeah. say that? Yes, you can. I'm you very can. Uh, particular about movies. So most of the movies I think are crap. I saw Get Out. I enjoyed that. Yes. I didn't think it was as great as everybody else thought, but I did enjoy it very much. And then um, this movie, Personal Shopper, I enjoyed. But so far, there hasn't been a lot of great movies. It's no, also early in the year. Yeah, but even last year, I wasn't crazy about you know all movies. I wasn't a La La fan. No, I, I had a tough time thinking it as the best movie. I actually I fell asleep during the movie, and I never do that. Like I know that some people do that all the time, right. but I never fall asleep during a movie, and I was like, it. I was not connecting to it. I enjoyed La La Land. I saw it in the theaters with my girlfriend, and it's the most people I've ever seen walk out of a movie. Eight people left. Wow. The movie. I think that a lot of times people, they just, a movie gets good reviews and they go, we should go see this movie. They don't realize it's a musical. People keep yes. going, what? And then leaving. So, but I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was great. I didn't think Moonlight was all that great either. Mm. I'm agreeing. I don't think it was a great year for movies last year. Now, Sean Donnelly does a podcast where you have to defend your movie. You pick a movie yes. that people are harsh on, and then you come up with why it's a great movie. Right. I want to defend um, Woody Allen movies and his behavior. I feel like I could really <laughs> get in there and say, hey, love is love. You know what I mean? Right. 
It doesn't matter if it's youth or your daughter, you know? <laughs> um, Are you a Woody fan? Huge Woody guy, yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I feel bad about whatever actions he's taken, but I can't... Um, I was already hugely influenced in loving the films before, so I try to separate. Yeah, I I normally can... Uh, I'm normally a hypocrite when it comes to that and go, yeah. oh, no. But uh, uh, what's your favorite Woody Allen's? I think uh, Hannah and Her Sisters is probably my favorite one. Yeah. I also love Everyone Says I Love You, and I love Annie Hall, and I love Match Point. Uh, you know probably what? Danny Rose is way up there, too. Yeah, I mean, when you start to make out a list of his, there's like... Ten movies that are as good as any movies that have ever been done, that he's done. Yeah. And that you could put against any movie. But one of my favorites, and people are harsh on, is Stardust Memories. Which yes. I fucking love that movie. And they killed him. The critics killed really? him on that well, one. Yeah. What was their beef with it? Uh, pretentious. Yeah. They always get people in being pretentious. That's weird, because normally that's like the kind of movie, like, a cr- it would be like the critics like the pretentiousness, but everybody well, else. Well, he was rough on critics and film lovers in right. that movie, so they took it personally. Right. They took it really personally, like, when he acted like the critics are nuts. <laughs> but there's, uh, you know, there's a theme of that in America, when an artist changes or does something a little bit different, people get very upset with them. Yeah. Bob Dylan, of course. Metallica. Mm. So I call him Sal Attica. You know what I mean? It's a way of just <laughs> taking him down a peg. You know, because they cut that hair. Yeah. All right, I'll I just got it. a text from Bobby Kelly. He got the part. Oh, yes! Yeah. This is amazing. Uh, fast. He walked in, they saw that jacket, and they're like, this is it. The idea of Bobby making it to Broadway that quickly is ridiculous. <laughs> um, that's ridiculous <laughs> giving him the part. Um, you think he stopped somewhere for a slice right now? Um... <laughs> By the way, that was hilarious what you two were doing to each other. <laughs> I and got you, worried that it wasn't funny. And no, it was, was very funny. Oh, good. It was very funny. He's a funny man. Wonderful man. And uh, yeah, I love him. I was glad he could come in for a few minutes. I appreciate you guys having us on Last of Minute. Of course. Any, anytime. You know that, dude. Well, yeah. Well, April 11th, uh, comedy from Mackenzie. Chris fell asleep an hour ago. Uh, I, 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 I love Mackenzie. I, love, um, I know you sleeping. love Mackenzie, but your job is like to be that plugging guy. That's how yeah. That's how we like you. Okay. All right. Comedy from Mackenzie. It's happening Tuesday, April 11th, but you, 8 Now you're making it seem like a bad thing. Yeah, don't make it thing. just less aggressive. Okay. Maybe do it in the gay character. That might bring oh, in a few. Oh, God. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say no. I know we don't com- like fun. Com- Comedy for Mackenzie, Tuesday, <laughs> April 11th at 8 p.m. at the Village Underground. Robert Kelly, Joe List, Nick DiPaolo, Mark Norman, they're all performing, and they're working on other people, according to Joe List. Go to ComedyCellar.com for tickets. Got to be a hot night. <laughs> Sounds like a hot night. <clears throat> it's a great lineup. I met it. Can I tell this uh, thing? Mm-hmm, sure. I, I want to I hear you guys' opinion on this. I was just in Montreal, Mount Royale, with my lovely wife-to-be, oh. Sarah Talamush, and uh, we did comedy, and I met this guy after the show. He was laughing the whole time. He was missing a tooth, and he was by himself, so it's a little you're skeptical mm-hmm. when someone's missing a front tooth. Now, granted, I have bad teeth, and I have a root canal. You never know. People have their own problems. But anyways, he was by himself, missing a tooth, laughing at every laughing at setups. Great audience member. And then afterwards, he came up to me. He told me he was an American diplomat, and he quickly showed me some card that said diplomat, which is a little strange when right. I feel like normal people just go, I'm this thing, and people just go, oh, okay. <laughs> well, like when I say I'm a comedian, I don't show a picture of myself on stage or a headshot. <laughs> Not that I would ever tell anyone I'm a comedian, but um, that's a side note. But So he put it away, and then we were talking hockey, and he says, this is a crazy story. I don't want to bore you with this story, but my son put on skates for the first time a year ago. He's playing for the Canadians right now. <laughs> Isn't that insane? Yeah. And sometimes, we you ever have someone lie so bad that you don't even want to call him out on it? Because you're like, oh, this must be a crazy person. Yeah. Surely he's a diplomat. But it's, <laughs> it's very strange. So he's trying to tell me, and then he said it's a boring story, which I don't know what kind of storyteller you are, that your son learned to skate and became a Montreal Canadian in 300 days. Yeah. And that's a boring story. <laughs> And then part of me thought, it's such a crazy lie that maybe it's... A, and I'm a hockey guy, by the way. So uh-huh. I went and looked up every Montreal Canadiens player. And sure enough, 
all of them have been playing previously to <laughs> sure. play for the show. Sure. That's weird. <laughs> yes. now, typically, professional sports teams don't have open trials. Yes. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that guy is out there. And then later he told me he's leaving his diplomatic position to be a um, statistician for the Toronto Blue Jays, which seemed less <laughs> money ball. insane. Less, yeah. But um, yeah, so I don't know if that guy is listening or if he's out there, but uh, he's a crazy person. I just... <laughs> I like just imagine though, like you're just saying, look, I I know diplomacy is important, I but I have this opportunity to be a statistician <laughs> for the Blue and Jays. I, I'm going for it, damn it. Which, I'm, I don't know how they would have heard of him. Like maybe he had. I don't know. What, I don't know what a diplomat does. I have yeah. to admit, I don't know what that even means. I know diplomatic means you know you're trying to be friendly. I guess. Yeah. Well, no diplomat. <laughs> yeah, you represent the country. Uh huh. And. And their uh, needs in a, in a foreign country. It's um, it's not something that you think of as the same way you think of as a baseball <laughs> statistician. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, one doesn't set up the other. But you come up with that thing of people that, I mean, adults are lying. Like, that's not like when a little kid lies. Yes. Yeah. What do you gain from that lie? Like, I if I came in here and I told you guys I just met Julia Roberts. And we made out. What would I gain from that? I'm not really sure. I know somebody who is a pathological liar. Yeah. Uh, and I've known her for a long time. I've known her since we were young. So it's like one of those things, like it's something that I decided to just accept about her. Right. But it's very uncomfortable when she would be meet other friends of mine mm -hmm. and they're like, uh, that person is a liar. <laughs> and yeah. I have yeah. to be like, oh, yeah, I know. I know that about her. It's, very... it's like an illness or something. Yeah, I think maybe that's what... It's very interesting because sometimes... Like, you'd think that if you're a pathological liar or a, a liar, you would improve at it. Like, right. you would get better at lying. Yeah. And have a lie that's like, oh, wow, interesting. She, like, she's terrible at it. Like, everybody picks up on it, and it's a lot of times it would be stuff... I mean, certainly when she was young, it was very, very poor. Uh, but even as an, an adult, I, I don't think that she's gotten much better at it. Like, people pick up on it immediately and go, that, that doesn't sound like it makes sense. And usually I have to look at them and be like, it's fine, just it's, let it go. It's very strange. I mean, I think our president might be a pathological liar also, but that's a side note. Well, he um, he he uh, accuses other people of lying, which is always great. Yeah, when you're the, he's <laughs> like that person's a lying nut. They're all liars. Um, <laughs> but do you know how many people that they bust every year for going around telling people that they're in that they were in Navy SEALs and they're not? You oh know? wow! And they're like, uh, people are in bars all the time going, "Yeah, it's great to be back from Afghanistan. Me and my SEAL team are all back now." And there are guys that are like ex Navy SEALs who just go around and pop people for it. Oh, fuck. Good for yeah. them. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because that at least seems like a lie to get laid. That I understand. I'm right. not condoning it. Yes. But to be like, yeah, man, I'm a, I, I sell parachutes and uh, whatever. <laughs> and uh, that was an actual lie I used to tell. But, um, <laughs> you know, you get laid. That's the thing. But this guy yeah. is not trying to have sex with me, I don't think. <laughs> right. I mean, the diplomat. Maybe. Yes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you'd think if you were going to say, my kid's a hockey... Maybe you have a shitty life, so you want right. to improve yourself. You'd think you'd say, my kid plays for the Montreal Canadiens. And that's it. That's it. That's the end say, of it. He, he learned how to skate a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just so crazy. Those guys have been skating since they were... A hat on a hat, if you will. Yeah. It's too much. <laughs> yes. Those guys... First of all, everyone in Canada kind of grows up skating. It seems insane. That anyone in Canada would wait until they were in their early 20s before they started skating. Right. Well, I think this guy would have been American, because he's an American diplomat. So it would have been this... An, an, According to that little paper, I don't think he's <laughs> an American seems pretty diplomat. official. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I so, had to uh, point out the other day to someone, like, because uh, they were driving with diplomat plates because somebody oh, yeah. was like, oh what why would why is their uh, license plate so strange they have special plates and when i was i used to work in a restaurant you also have to take taxes like they'll show you their card at the end of the meal and you're like shit now you gotta go back to the computer and put in a special code that needs a manager I didn't code, know this pull off the taxes because diplomats uh do not have to pay taxes in really country. yeah oh wow they also can't be arrested for a crime what yeah, yeah they can only be asked like, if it, you get raped by a diplomat, that diplomat can be taken out of the country and, and kicked out of the country, but cannot be arrested. Why? Yeah. How is that? How can that be? Well, it's so, be, it's so all the other countries don't just constantly 
arrest diplomats under trumped up charges right oh so they uh, they're all i mean we're gonna hope that diplomats aren't raping people uh but a lot of them do you know i hope nobody rapes anybody i felt like it's really (laughs) off-putting behavior well see the other thing with diplomat is they they don't get checked at the border coming through so there's been some that you know accused of delivering drugs and stuff like that because you can't check them coming into the country mm-hmm. yeah it's diplomatic immunity or whatever that's what it is that's it's diplomatic word. immunity i know a kid who was uh in high school that his his father was a diplomat i think from russia and he did whatever the fuck he wanted because he was the son of a diplomat so he could speed and just the oh, high school it passes shit. it down huh yeah yeah now, do you know i mean you seem to know a lot about diplomats are you allowed <laughs> to place your son on a very successful national <laughs> hockey league <laughs> My son, <laughs> he knows how to skate. Not he can't skate backwards, but he can skate forward. Yeah. You just stick him he on just a line. Started. He can't play defense. <laughs> yeah, so I, diplomat. Yes, I know you only get twenty players, and you're competing for the Stanley Cup. But um, <laughs> Chris, is there some reason you're not helping this kid I, today? Look, <laughs> this is this is for Mackenzie. All right, Joe Liss is in studio. The benefit show, comedy. But from say McKen- it in a nice way, please. Uh, oh, I, I am. Like, Comedy for Mackenzie. It's happening Tuesday, April 11th at 8 p.m. at the Village Underground. Robert Kelly, Joe List, Nick DiPaolo, Mark Norman, and more will be performing ComedyCellar.com for tickets. And here's the thing. Even if you're similar to Chris in that you don't care about sick children, it's right. still I going to be a great show. Oh, it's going to yeah. be a funny show, and you're not going to be bringing up sad facts about children. No. It'll just be straight comedy. No. Her folks will be there. I don't think she will be there because um, she's very young. Um, but, yeah, so, like, like you know, if you're, if you're completely... Um, it's meaningless to you that other people are less fortunate than you. It's fine. I you have no empathy, deal. Chris. Not very much, no. Why? I don't know. I've noticed this about you. I'm not sure. I uh, maybe from my bad childhood. That, oh, but we've that's already been through. Yeah, that. we're not I mean, going to go gonna, through. I mean, you're not going to be. <laughs> that's Bobby Kelly's bed. Yeah, yeah he's yeah, going you, right to it right now. Bobby was kicked downstairs. He's very yeah. empathetic. And you heard about the track team. That's true. Yeah, that so was you're not going to beat I never, that. I never even tried for the track team. And by the way, bad things happen. Shouldn't that make you more empathetic? Right. You think? You ha- yes. Less, Some yes. people. I mean, it's a choice in your life. You have bad stuff happen to you when you're young, or you have bad things that have happened to you in your past. There's a choice and a path to go down. Will it make you a more empathetic person, uh, or does it make you uh, cold and it's, not? It's made care me cold. To, <laughs> quite quite care cold. To plug. <laughs> but yes. I care about Mackenzie for that. You know. April 11th at the Village Underground. ComedyCellar.com for tickets. Hot show. Village Underground. Yeah. What, a, what a great club over there, too, huh? Oh, yeah. That's something else. That mm. is something else. <laughs> Love hot, hot room. Yeah. Hot dog. <laughs> hot diggity. I'm trying to guess who some of the big stars that are going to be dropping in on. Well, we don't, you know, I don't really have them yet, but yeah. somebody we're going to get. We're trying to get David Tell on there, and uh, but Dave's Dave's hard, hard to get a grasp on, you know. He's very... Everybody feels yeah. that way. Yeah, he's very... Uh, he moves quickly. No one... I, I consider him like the comedy Batman, because no one knows where he... What his actual personal life is. He's the most mysterious comedian I've ever yeah. encountered. I'll give you another one I consider mysterious. Judah Freelander. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know whether he's in a relationship or what. You know what I mean? Like, you just can't tell. But he'll talk to you, though. He talks. Yeah. So if you get into a conversation with oh, him. Oh, yeah, he's yeah. great. You get a glimpse of it. And yeah. I feel like I have over the last, like, two years. There'll yeah. be, like, little windows into his his truthful personality, who he really is. Yeah. Well, he's the champion. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's for sure. Yeah. Champion of the whole world. They he, say... Losing love is like a window into your heart. Everybody sees you're blown apart. Everybody mm-hmm. sees the wind blow. I'm going to Graceland, Graceland, Memphis, oh, Tennessee. Tennessee. I'm, I'm going, going to Graceland. Graceland. <laughs> Poor boys. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, that was really a fun moment. You know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we were just saying that that doesn't. That's one of those things in movies that doesn't really happen, where yes, you and all your friends sing along to a song, and we just did it. Yeah, it actually did. is truthful. Maybe the greatest American songwriter. Paul I Simon. think so. Yeah, yeah. I think that he's he's number one for me. And then Jackson Brown is uh, right there for me Boy, as well. Yeah. He kills me too, man. I'm going to see him uh, in Staten Island, April 12th, the day after the comedy for Mackenzie. I'll oh, be at Jackson uh, Brown, and that's happening. Yeah, the day before, <laughs> April 11th, on the Village Underground. Joe List, Bob Kelly, Nick DePaul, Mark Norman, all performing. ComedyCellar.com for tickets. Could you imagine if you got Jackson Brown to step in it? 
Maybe right. he will. You never know. Holy Welcome. shit. If Is he sang right to Mackenzie's. <gasps> oh, my God. Oh, Could you do that? Joe? Yes. Make it happen, Joe, for Mackenzie. Keep a fire burning. <laughs> um, I told you, I think I told this story on the show before. I made Jackson Brown laugh out loud real well, hard tell me. at Long Island. Yeah. He was doing a sh- I was the youngest guy there, and all these people were shouting out. It was a solo acoustic, and everyone was shouting out all these songs to play. And then I said, play whatever you want, I trust you. And he really laughed a lot. He's like, I like that, I like that one. I like so that. we have a bond, you know. Yeah, I hope it comes up again. Yeah. So you Try go to see him again. quite a bit, whenever you get the opportunity. I do, yeah. And he's playing April 6th, which is my birthday, out in uh, Long Island, but I'm missing that show. I gotta do a, I'm doing another fundraiser. I just do a lot of fundraisers, you know what I mean? I just care about the people. You do, you're yeah. raising funds for people. Yes. You know? In the meantime... Bobby Kelly's talking about bananas, and he's got his own personal career. He's yeah. an actor. No, it's you know. But a lot of people don't care about the afterlife. I'm trying to get somewhere nice, you know. Oh, is that it? Is you're doing this all for heaven? <laughs> this is like a mad dash for heaven? It's just, it's so hard to sit on a cloud in real life, because it's just water and you fall through it. But in heaven, it seems like you can bounce around on it. Yeah. From what I've read. <laughs> I'm going to play a harp there. I'm just going to play a light harp. You don't, you don't even need lessons. That's the great thing about having you just I didn't it. even know that. You could just pick it up and play the harp. I yeah. didn't know that. I thought I'd have to take lessons Mm-mm. for the first nope. 100 or 200 <laughs> no. years. No. And within, uh, my, my son, he plays the harp. And within a year, he's playing for the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think yeah. about playing the harp. <laughs> what, 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 what would a harp joke go? I'm we playing, center, yeah, like, like Carnegie Met, Hall. Met. Yeah, yeah, what's like the big the Met. Or- <laughs> yeah. Bernstein? Yeah. Yeah. Electric Bernstein. Light Orchestra? Oh, oh. God, they're Ooh. clear. They That'd be great. Good. All right, There's we got to wrap this topic. up. Joe, always great to see you. And Thanks I, for having me. I, I know we might have started a little slow here today, but I hope it picked up. Yeah. I feel like I should have been funnier. I think it's no. on me. No, I can't, you can't be funnier, dude. You can't be funnier than you were today. Oh, You're that, that <laughs> damn good. <laughs> Joe Liss has been in the studio. The Benefit Show, Comedy for McKenzie's. Happening. Now you finally mentioned it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want I'm everyone sorry. to know about this. <laughs> it's happening Tuesday, April 11th at 8 p.m. at the Village Underground. Robert Kelly, Joe Liss, Nick DiPaolo, Mark Norman, and some special guests. We're all going to be there. ComedySeller.com for tickets. And Renee and Georgette McGreet and their dog after the war. I'm trying mm-hmm. to look that one up. The great Paul Simon. Mm-hmm. I, that's it for us. See you again in 1974. Ladies and gentlemen, the evening is over. We hope you all enjoyed yourselves, and we'll see you all again in 1974. Good evening! Yeah! Yeah!